tickets. And then use an open ended return, which never gets served. Um, never gets cancelled. <laughs> For some reason, they don't cancel never. returns. So you buy wow. Z and then you've got, you use the return leg for the six weeks in the for. Brilliant. I will try that. <laughs> God. Sorry, but yeah, I didn't wish to kind of. Uh, I think that's an excellent thing to learn. <laughs> it's like when you doubt Italian, bureaucracy is Italian. <laughs> that's right. Well done, Matthias. Speaking of which, let us have a moment. To think about the Jesuits and the importance of selling off all the gold. Nobody's keeping up with the papacy, I see. Oh, the papacy, oh, they still have them. Piscatore Re. Yes. <laughs> He's selling, he wants to sell all the gold from the Vatican. I think that's a great idea. Perhaps you should talk to um, the British about the decision to sell off all the gold. Mm -hmm. Oh, he can't because nobody's turning up for his, um, for his inauguration. What a shame. Perhaps we should just send Gordon Brown and they could go. That's right. Who? You know, it would I think Tony Blair. Be, if, it, well, if we sent Gordon Brown, Brown, it would be at once a huge snub, even bigger than not sending anybody to <laughs> And two, they could discuss the merits of selling off the nation's gold and the, um, you know, the relative uh, value to be had in that. Yeah, and how well it worked. Yes, fantastic. Yeah, no, I think it's Enriches good. But, the but, nation. But on the plus side, if, you know, if, he, if it does destroy the church, you know, no, pop, no, no. Yeah. No, it's just symbolic. It thinks it's on the size of the poor. Is it just symbolic? Just Somebody who says it's, it, it, it's on the size of the poor and that all is done or what is published is that he washes poor people's feet. Honestly, that's not being on the side of the poor. It's just. No, that's being on the side of the cleaners. Yes, and yes. it's reenacting no, metaphors. There's nothing else. Well, also, wasn't he involved with the uh, disappearance? Oh, I mean, that seems a little bit more problematic. The 9,000 disappeared in Argentina. Um, he didn't uh, help shield the priest or whatever it was when they were being attacked. Yeah, all these skeletons. Okay, so we're just waiting on a few more people. Samira's not going to be here because she's not able to get here. Um, I think Giancarlo hasn't been here for a couple of weeks, so I'm not sure what his story is. And it's conceivable that Di has now decided that she would rather be in the MA class. So it might just be on the skies. Killing them off like flies. <laughs> okay. So, um, also I have to say that, you know, Derrida and the question of difference is very complex. But I'm sure that you mustered yourselves through it. Um, and I uh, kind of wanted to say uh, just a few words before we began. Are we able to, shall we wait a few moments or can we begin? We can begin now. Yeah, or shall we wait? Is there anybody else that you think will be turning up? Yeah, I think we're, I think we're part four. Okay, um, right. Um, there's a couple things that you need to bear in mind. First of all, most of the work that um, that we're looking at, I thank you very much, by the way, for sending the uh, links, uh, is coming from margins um, of philosophy. Uh, I also brought to show you uh, the book by Jeffrey Bennington, which again I would like to preface all these, you know, secondary reading book uh, comments by saying it is a secondary source, but. It's a decent book, and Jeffrey Bennett is a genius, so you might as well read what he has to say. Um, and it came out in 1993. Um, so it's quite a, uh, it's quite an interesting, uh, he calls it a uh, dare on the base, which is um, very useful. And, and, um, and Derrida calls himself circumfession. So they get into this whole question of time and infinitude and so on. And, and it's, um, I'll pass it around so you can take a look at it. Uh, but so you can just see it. Margins of Philosophy is a tough book, um, but a, quite an interesting one, obviously. And um, what I would hope we can do today, though I'm not saying it is possible, is one is to get uh, get an understanding of how this notion of difference a is being put forward. Uh, that is um, what what is Derrida saying, both in the chapter on difference and also for any of you that started then reading it, uh, you know, what he was saying in, in the piece beforehand in, in Tim Khan and uh, in the later essays. 
but uh, but basically how it's connected with the use of sound of, of, of speech language put it slightly differently you have the question of language that he's somehow coming obliquely to he's not coming he's not dealing with it straight on you have the question of uh, the relationship between writing and speech and again he's coming to this obliquely and not um, dead on and you have the question of uh, where this fits between Hegel and Heidegger and what he's doing with the two now so that's all within margins then, you, then what I would also like to address is then how this difference is either different, similar, or saying something altogether you know, in another world than what Leotard is suggesting in, uh, in his Differend, and also what is being suggested in Concealed Revealed. Well, that's okay. Thanks. Thanks. Wait. So, Okay, um, and then whether or not, and if so, how does this connect with what we're doing with Freud? I feel bad about the, I mean, I feel good and bad about the way we have handled uh, the sort of little run into Freud. It was, uh, I thought it was a very good session that uh, Grace and Lauren and, and um, Dane, um, well, you know, actually, um, and Mark began to tease out last week. It was a very straightforward one. It's one of the few times we've done a straightforward session. <laughs> As a result, I wasn't sure if anybody liked it, and apparently people loved it, so that was good. Uh, but I just want to make sure that we're not doing uh, Freud by paint by numbers, or you know, Lacan paint by numbers, because it, 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 every one of these ways in are trying to deal with the unsayable something, that which we, that there is something that makes a coherent whole, whole, H-O-L-E, when it includes in its systemizing logic that which cannot be said, that which cannot be pointed to, that which cannot be dealt with. So, um, so everybody has some sort of relationship, everybody that we've looked at, Lacan, Freud, Heidegger, of course, revealing and concealing, um, and so on. So I've just, I want to just sort of note caution, of course, Leotard as well. Okay, so to begin, uh, just a few remarks before. Um, Lauren, are you gonna, Lauren and uh, Barnaby, you two are the ones that are giving the presentation? I'm, 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 I'm innocent. Not. No, I, I, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm true. supposed to. I, I haven't read the text or all put it all put with me. And I've read it before. Um, okay, good so, save. Sorry? <laughs> good yeah, save. Thanks. Um, but I, I'm sorry, okay, I that's right. time to prepare anything. Um, Material you No, then. I did a reading of the pharmacon. You did the pharmacon. Yeah. Okay, great. Right. Okay, right. Okay. <coughs> Two. Okay. Um, so what I just want to say to start is the way in which one understands the question that Derrida is raising in Margins of Philosophy, and the profound and provocative um, scenario that he's trying to address, and basically what he says in the book and what he says in this way in, is saying that philosophy has the odd uh, characteristic of taking itself as an object and finding itself as the answer, which is fantastic, it sounds like many of us. Okay, so in order for there to be a real address of the issues that philosophy may or may not properly deal with, uh, Derrida is asking one to think about how a margin is established, and by that he then makes the slide into questions of limits. And once you're in the question of limits, you raise the bar, as it were, sorry, about dialectics on the one hand, on the other hand, thesis, antithesis, this, this notion of the deep cut, the notion of the abyss. You start talking about uh, ways in which meaning has always been established, and meaning gets established usually when a limit is made to be drawn somehow so that otherwise it just goes off into oblivion. So he starts by 
making the reference to Tim Pan uh, in the uh, in the preface that he writes to the book, which I know that you weren't meant to be reading, but just to give you the summary. Uh, and the Tim Pan in French. Does anybody know what that means? Before I say what it means, does anybody know French enough to know what that means? It's the, it's the Tim Pan is the tympanic membrane, or the, or the yeah. Um, the it, yeah. It's what? Yeah. It's, 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 Disruption. Disruption. And it's a slang as well in Fran French. Um, and if you if something is acting to panic or is being, um, do it, what do you think that would mean if I were using that as a, I mean, in the context of difference, in the context of margins. So if something is a membrane, so therefore acting like a skin of some kind, but acting as a skin around which resonances come in and out, um, then, the, then the question becomes, what would be a reason, do you think, that a preface to a book on margins of, of philosophy would be called Tim Pong? Well, I think, I think we did Okay. Sort of shaking the, the sort of like when it's that stretched surface, it sort of shakes the surface and sort of disrupts all the sort of um, coherence that forms so sort of all this register to be really reorganized. So if I called you, if I said, Lauren, you're so you're so tympanic, what would you hear? What would that be? What are they accusing you of doing? Oh, and shifting everything around in, uh, so that all the means are in the Yeah. So you're disruptive, you're a rabble rouser, you're pain. I mean, not you, but a tympanic environment. That's what that means. So he's he's playing with that. You need to know this, you, just in order to actually hear what is now being said with the difference. Difference. Yes. Yes. I always found fantastic that there is a parallel text. Yes. An equal, uh, which is very important because some. Not, not in this specific essay, but some uh, edition, English editions of Derrida put all the footnotes at the end of the book, yeah. which is the most blasphemous thing one can do. Yes. Uh, with philosophy in general, but with Derrida in particular. Yes. Um, but that's not a footnote. No, this is not a footnote. That's a column. But, yeah, but, yeah. Um, but there are footnotes yeah. there. Yeah. And um, so there is this disordering, or this creating trouble, but there's also questioning the passage. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like the timpan is line between the main text and the support yeah. the side text. This line in between is what is the thing. But, it, but you're being too literal there because also the tympanic is the voice of that column interrupting the voice of the other column. So it's true that you might see a membrane as it were, but it's the membrane of the voices that are being, or the con of what's being said in those columns. Mm -hmm. And what is being said in that smaller column? I, I also, I also um, understood it a slightly different way, which is that he was, with this kind of call for the tympanic, that he was recognizing that there was a central hierarchy, um, or if you, if you don't want to use the word hierarchy, I kind of... I thought you were going to say if you don't want to use the word central. Well, I was going to say a cent that there was, a, there was a kind of a central notion of vision, a central, a central vision, uh, a primacy of vision, and then um, a concentricity of other senses and he was effectively uh, inviting us to devolve our central experience one one order to the auditory mm -hmm. um, which parallels his introduction his his invitation to um, seek meaning in the margins so in many ways he was he was inviting us to take a step away from the centrality of visual meaning um, and into the meaning generated by second Order, the second order senses, I mean, yes. and then by extension, further, um, less, less senses away from the primary. But I think it's a kind of yes, recognition, excellent. recognition of the, of the. Uh, I don't know how. I don't know how much. It's. A dis it's I don't know how if he's disordering the senses or even, or or affirming that they exist in a kind of hierarchical concentric. Uh, yeah. Pattern, um, because he's not talking about destroying the text. What he's doing is he's talking about um, 
the body of the text and its margins or footnotes or secondary sources. I mean, in, throughout the book, all the kind of juicy bits, all the interesting and rich uh, ideas are found in the footnotes in the margin. I mean, it, it's, I was laughing when you say blasphemous because, you know, uh, um, but nevertheless, you're absolutely right. It's completely, completely defeats the purpose and the intention of Derrida and his arrangement of the book to put the notes at the end because you can't you can't work otherwise and this 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 insistence on the auditory rather than the, the visual or the textual mm -hmm. is what what I took to be yes. kind of like way to seek the meaning in this book. Yes, and and that's a very good point. So obviously you remember a lot from your past research. It's, it's a good book. It is a good book. It's bordering on a great book in fact. Yeah, so, um, so, um, so the first thing then to, is to get a sense of how, under the Duchampian mode, the eye becomes the, the center of you know visual culture, the visual art. This notion of the visual being the um, the move, and uh, Derrida is trying to undo that. That's the first thing, and he's undoing it. The, you know, that whole, the whole group of them, Deleuze, Derrida, uh, Lacan, um, Blanchot, uh, Belloponte, Foucault, all of them are, are suggesting ways in which the senses must come into the question of philosophy. As a result, most of them get thrown out of philosophy environments, Derrida being the primary one. So Derrida... Uh, was often not taken up in philosophy for the first, you know, 40 years. Anyway, you know, I was thinking about this book. This book was written, the, the first time he gave a lecture on the Tim Pen was in 68. Yes. Isn't that very depressing? You know, that we're, it's now 2013. I mean, maybe, the good news, maybe there's two different ways to read this, but it's taken 45 years <laughs> for people to begin to discuss or to uh, maybe keep discussing on some level what seems to be an important breakthrough that was happening, and not just with Derrida, but the whole group. And then it just sort of quietly goes off, dies somewhere. So I find it, you know, an important thing that we're re revisiting this. Um, just, just, just the level of trying to think what was going on in that time period that produced this whole series of ways of breaking with the logos. And they had different answers to how that got broken, or the notion of castration, or the notion of. Uh, you know, whatever the various ways in which they are putting forward the, um, the discursive field. But uh, at least this way, what Derrida is at least presenting here is this move to think about how an ear sees. Um, so I think that that is important here. And the next part that's important is the way in which a field is then established uh, by virtue of this, um, this setting up the uh, kind of limitations of which are established via sens sensory limitations as opposed to logical limitations. So I, I think that if you have a chance, you should certainly read this. Um, and the also the other thing is to try and see what is really on the side of uh, this little um, scenario. I, I once wrote an um, article, um, it was on Lacan, and on one call, I wrote two columns, and one column was the analytic side of Lacan, the other was porn. And it literally said exactly the same thing, but one said it in the language of porn, and one said it in the language of, you know, um, it was amazing that it got published in respectable journals, but anyway, it did. Uh, because when I first started writing philosophy as such, I refused to publish them in academic journals. I only published in porn mags. And, um, you know, with the view that probably people would never read it because they really are only looking at the pictures. But there is always the minor possibility that someone might sort of read it. And, um, and that's where I thought philosophy belonged. I thought philosophy belonged in porn magazines. Um, and obviously I've been chastised for that. And now we have to have graph in the gold standard. Which, may I make a, a, a slight interruption here? Do you mind? I just remembered to tell you this. I meant to tell you this at the outset. As of the 1st of April, uh, there is the decision here, and I mentioned this last week, um, that uh, set forward by um, 
the Tory uh, Lib Dems, Con Dems, or Consuls, uh, that any academic who receives money from a research council must publish in what they call gold standard text, must publish their findings in gold standard text. Those gold standard texts must be open access at the point of publication. So since they are commercially run environments, Oxford University Press, Rutledge, or whatever the story is, um, they are now saying that the author needs to pay for their um, article to be published. Each article uh, for the arts and humanities is between 1,500 and 2,000 pounds. Uh, for it to be read by a journal that is considered gold standard. Now, it may not be accepted, it's just for it to be read. Um, if it's accepted, it might be more than 2,000, um, but at that very minimum. That's going into uh, effect on the 1st of April. Has it been decided? I don't know, there was a big outcry. There was a big outcry. Um, and it's, I mean, the last I heard was that it was still going through the 1st of April. But I just got an email yesterday um, stating that there was a possibility that it was being, um, there's, a, there's a bit of a, a time lag, but I've not heard any more of the time lag. So there's two routes. One is called the green route, and one's called the gold standard route. In case you hear, and there's actually other colors. They'd have the purple route, and the white route, and the gray route, and whatever. But the ones that concern us for academic purposes is the green route and the gold standard route, and, um, or route. And um, the gold standard means that that's the only one that will be acceptable by research councils. It'll be the only one acceptable by employers, by universities, by whatever. So if you publish somewhere else, too bad. Um, now, the green standard is if you publish in a journal that's considered peer-reviewed and has all the right pedigree to it, but they don't charge the um, author, then uh, it's, it won't be considered gold standard, but it will be considered uh, in the first, uh, I think it was the first four months or the first year, nobody, it, the, the, the journal has to make its money up. And therefore, you can't count your article in REF or any of these other things in the first year of its publication. But afterwards, you can count it. It's, it's got some sort of crazy hierarchy like this. Or there's the gold standard. This is all under the, the thing called open access. This is how it's been read. So I just wanted to mention that because, like I said, in the olden days, when I was publishing philosophy text to start with, I published in not only not recognized journals, but anti-recognized journals. Um, you know, so I mean, they were seriously um, snubbing um, the academy. But nowadays, it's much more problematic. Even if you just wanted to set up a fanzine, or you want. So, for example, we have the thesis, and right now I'm trying to find out whether or not we can do the gold standard, but not charge, if that's actually possible, for Article Press. Because uh, because I've taken over Article Press and um, you know whether or not we can publish books on this and how, so just let me mention this. Okay, now back to deferrals. So um, the the thing that um, Derrida sets up here and these you know like for example I think the way he's writing this talk this is why it made me think about it as well, these kind of parallel things this of course would be problematic in a gold standard because you never know what would be allowed as your template you know so it's a, anyway so without getting completely furious I'm going off on a tangent uh, a big tangent uh, so the first thing is then is to understand the way in which this uh, the ocular and the audio become an uh, an aural, A-U-R-A-L. Um, and so there's a whole move to uh, privilege, not oral, but aural hearing. Um, so it's not just speaking, it's the way in which the hearing of the speaking happens. And this is a very Heideggerian move, the relation between hearing and listening, for example. That's a Heideggerian shift. And he's specifically dealing with that. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, just just to put this on the table so you have a sense of it, and then we'll get into the pharmacon. So we'll move into, because I think that makes the most logical next move. Is that in uh, the the timpan, he's asking the question: How does philosophy assert the other? How does it understand other? How does it understand that which is, let's say, part of the family, but not part of the 
people are allowed to sit at the table. How, how do you understand this other thing? And this is when he gets into the question of, um, of how simulacra works, or what he call in his columns, he calls them putrid simulacra, which is again the smell. He's talking about you know, when smell comes into a simulacra. So a simulacra, what is a simulacra? Just so we have that. Does anybody remember what simulacra means? Sorry, it's a quote. Copy copy without original. Co copy without what? Original. Without an original. I think it's a copy without Rousseau. No, no, original. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Anything else about a simulacra? Because that is at least the stepping off point. It's a copy without an original. What else? Why is it? Why, why is it used in in theory, in philosophy, in art? So, what what does it conjure up? Escape identity. <coughs> oh. Yes. How does it escape identity? Well, it's sort of because it's without an origin. So, without essence. So, for example, on page X on the column, he writes. <coughs> The acanthus leave copied in school when, for better or worse, one learns to use the fusain, the stem of a morning glory or other climbing plant, the helix inscribed on the shell of a snail, the meanders of the small and the large intestine, the sandy serpentine excreted by the earthworm, the curl of childish hair encased in a medallion, the putrid simulacra drawn by a slight pressure of the fingers from a clave click. What do you think? What does simulacra mean here? Mm, what's it? Is that the last one? It's a French. My French is. <coughs> oh, sorry. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, not yes. I'll just want to that. I'll have to think about simulacra. Yeah. I'll think about the. Don't jump down my throat. I was thinking about. I didn't hear this. The temporal arts. You know, the arts like music where you have to score and yeah. you repeat them. Or, uh, where, where's that sense? Where's the, 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 the original set? But there's a classical metaphysical problem there. You know, where's Hamlet? It's not the book on the shelf. It's yeah, not yeah. the play. So, yeah, where is the Hamlet? I was thinking it's all around this kind of uh, idea of the similar premise. Uh, yes, I think that's very important. From, yeah, can you thing. say that again so people can hear that? Temporal arts. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I think you had this one out of the door. Temporal arts. So, the things on the score that kind of, you know, uh, the, the artist interprets each time, but the score isn't isn't the music, it isn't the original. It's right. Not, it's not, yeah. But also, you know, the score it manifests everywhere, all over the place. So it's 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 just trying to find well, what is where is the damn thing? Where is Hamlet? What is Hamlet? Well, you can't point to where we're going to where we just come. So there's this idea of there's no original to it. Right. Um, and uh, and each each time you come to it, you're producing something which again is is, is a new is a new piece. It's a new every time, kind of like Just thinking around this idea, I've just been thinking about this, thinking about this in terms of the three sides. So, what would be the difference between the simulacra of a simulacrum of um, what Derrida is putting forward here and the simulacra of, let's say, Bouriard or Bouriard? The um, author guy. No, no, not Baudrillard. I mean, Baudrillard. Uh, not Baudrillard. Baudrillard. I can never say that man so bad. There's too many B-O's and B-A's. Yeah. Does anybody know? Um, the connection between Baudrillard and, and no, musical no, score? No, no, no. The, the different forms of simulacrum. Because I want to make sure that everybody gets. I mean, we have the basic, let's say, jumping off point that it's, you know, something that exists without an origin. So. In what way would something, let's say, be the putrid simulacrum drawn by a slight pressure of the fingers from what uh, this is a peri la colique, which means as I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that I necessarily agree that it's um, a, would you say a representation without an original? I'm sort of looking at both. No, a copy. Something like copy without an original. Um, I think it's, it's, Contested, c contested, where the verisimilitude exists, um, and it's a shifting, unstable relation between an original, a so-called original, and its representative, um, its representation, um, and that's really where 
Bohia comes in because he uh, he uh, theorizes that in fact the entire repository of the very similitude, the real, is lies within the simulacra. But um, I'm, I think that he he probably occupies uh, just one one sort of more extreme um, vision on this, or one more extreme position of the puzzle, one extreme perspective on the on this. And I think that there are there are others. And I, you know, for some reason, I was thinking about this on the train on the way up. But um, he he, I think that he articulates what is implied in the in the writings of others on the simulacra. Um, mm -hmm. And in many ways, I think that he, he tends to have been devalued as a thinker because he's, he's privileged what was implied. So he's actually, he's actually put forward in his, in his writing. taking as a given. What yeah, was what, what was kind of like lurking, sort of unsaid and concealed in other thinkers. Yes. Um, so he's at once done something that's, that's not particularly original um, in his thought and has an, a sort of betrayed the kind of notion of the marginal or the peripheral or the, uh, the, the concealed, if you want to put it in Heideggerian terms, um, in his writing, which is perhaps why he's kind of like had his sort of flash moment of, yeah. of fortune and then has sort of um, himself kind of dwindled into uh, dwindled into uh, marginality, but um, I don't think it's. I don't think he, he doesn't own the concept of simulacra, um, no. uh, although he might be the kind of most famous name associated with it. And um, I think it's a bit da dangerous to sort of say that he, you know, his position is the. I mean, he's the notorious. Oh position. no, no, I'm not saying that. Um, what I'm saying is that there's different positions mm. of simulacra, and I want to make sure that everybody knows the variety of the. It's like the garden. There's there's a set of you know. I don't know flowers, and there's a you know, there's a different versions of them. I think and yeah, the most so the important thing. So the one that Derrida is talking about. Yeah, it, the, the most important thing to, I think, to get to terms with the simulacrum is that there's a second order. There's a there's a there's a separation out from from one thing to another, and that um, one becomes two. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's. There, there, there may be some kind of connection, and that connection is negotiable, and perhaps is negotiated on the kind of on the, so the where the you know it's an economy of the real. Where is where is it thin? Where is it thick? Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, we've gone from one to two, and that's that's that we know that uh, that the representative isn't isn't the original. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So and I think that's where. That's where um, the Derrida is going to go, because whereas I've sort of made quite clear vector type mm -hmm. relationships, I think that where, where Derrida is just about to go is that um, this distance, or this this failure to the proximal failure, is far from being a straight line. It's a labyrinth uh, right. uh, arrangement. And it's and therefore he keeps going into this question of like how a snail, the cockerel uh, environment of the uh, the way in which something can have um, a totally different shape to it other than the usual uh, concentric circles or the you know the flow from A to B or the ding, no, okay, so um, there will be a couple of things I'll, I'll slide back to but I just wanted to make this as a very gentle opening so that you could see that, uh, that A, he's questioning the way in which a limit is understood as a limit in order that one not get rid of limits, but to rethink the way in which uh, they keep being re-invoked to set up the either Hegelian models or um, something that doesn't quite bring in the senses. So that, that's, that's where we're going to go with this, with the difference between difference versus difference. Now, I think that it would be useful then to hear the backstory of the Pharmacon, which is why I asked you to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. And then if you can throw out this backstory on what it is to have these doubles and so on. So that on the one hand, so bearing in mind when Dane is speaking, that that there's a that the reason we're trying to think this through 
is the re is is in order to come up with the way in which these surfaces get established. So a surface that may or may not have, you know, in the Heideggerian move, the surface becomes this relation between Dasein and, and being. In some other environment, it could be an economy. In a third version, it could be something that's both systematic and re is repellent to systems. So this is where I think Derrida is trying to go with that. So over to you, Dane. Um, so, with so they're just trying to undo these oppositions, which are prevalent all through philosophy. You know, in starting with Plato seems the best way to start that. Um, so, with Plato. In the Socratic dialogues, it's this opposition between writing and speaking. One is where speech is the centralized, the privileged thing, and uh, writing is the marginalized. It's it's villainized. It's vilified. It's pushed away. And what Derrida is going to do with the farmer comes to see how they they're not opposites. They you can't deal with one without bringing in the other. There's always a, they're always both there. They they both well, they're both there because there's in this idea of the farmer it's it's the unstable, it's the loose thread. He talks about the word and texture that doesn't really fit in the because of that instability, the whole text becomes unstable, and you can't really privilege the speech and the writing because of this one, because of the pharmacon, which has that idea of it's the poison, but it's also the medicine, the cure. And what, what Plato does again is he centralizes the, the meaning of pharmacon, he tries to establish as the poison, as the fatal drug, that which you should avoid, it's bad. And, um, but can I just, I just want to, just a slight uh, clarification. He's not saying that uh, speech and writing are the same thing. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, he's not saying that they're different, right? So when you use the concept of the poison, poison can be good or bad. It's not poison can be writing or speech. Mm -hmm. Right, or something like that. So be careful because the good and the bad, as it were, of the poison, which is also a medicine, uh, is not quite analogous to speech and writing in the sense that they're not opposite. They're not one's good and one's bad, or one's bad and one's good. So the vilification of writing over the, you know, uh, you know, in the beginning there was the word, and that wasn't, you know, um, written as a spoken word. Um, it's not that people or communities or whatever, uh, that there was some sort of general status quo acceptance of speaking over writing, and therefore writing was the, the villain in this story, and he's going to change it around to say, oh, no, no, they're both okay. But there's something else that's much more delicate in that, which I know you'll get to, but I just want to raise that as a, as a feature when you're talking, because the pharmacon is, is a multiplicity. It's, a, it's an entity that is itself a multiplicity. Okay. okay. Um. Uh. Can I just say one thing? Okay. Yeah, sure. Sure. Thanks. Um, um, Greek Hellenistic philosophy is, I think, reading um, Martha Nussbaum. Nussbaum, Nussbaum yeah. yeah. Her book on um, theory and practice. Or, um, um, they're, they're kind of a med medical base. They're, um, they're trying to um, soul doctors is the idea. Um, I think this is why mm -hmm. you know they're all quite, they all go for this. It's all about trying to um, I lost the word, but it's all about trying to sort of bring people to uh, um, a better, better. I think maybe let's see as it were. You know, I can't hear the word, but and this is I think healed. Pardon? Healed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
um, part. And uh, um, there's a, for me, having seen this, there's a great pressure behind the whole drama, you know, the whole, the whole of uh, Greek early Greek philosophy is sort of um, it's like an upside down triangle or pyramid. Is you know, pressure on this whole word pharmaca. I just wanted to sort of, but not to put any more pressure on you, but. But the, the pressure's there in, in the word itself, in the history of philosophy. Right. Like this idea that philosophy as a therapeutic, there's the word, therapeutic philosophy. Yeah. Um, and they're all like that. Of course, you certainly mark that, as it were. Um, but they, she's coming out of, um, not coming out of, but certainly been moved by Foucault's um, History of Sexuality 3. Yeah. Um, and these ideas. And um, I think they have probably found it. Well, but the thing about the pharmacon, I mean, just to follow up on that, is that it's not just some sort of word that Derrida's picked out of the air and thought, okay, this looks like a good one to use. Um, in that sense, yeah, it brings forward. It's not. It's not an innocent word that he's just sort of placing, but it is placed in relationship to writing and to speech, and that's what we have to think about. Okay, so there's something to do with this there. You know, like yeah. the speaking cure. The writing cure. I mean, we hear it today um, in whatever it's called, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, and this kind of thing. So, in Kierkegaard and Hegel, when uh, you know, when uh, Kierkegaard says, you know, that faith is the end process, it's not the immediate process. Right. And um, the universal in Hegel, where she's all about, where faith is it's all about the speaking out of everything. Everything must be must be revealed, as it were. I think that's part of the history. Of this Right, well this whole, yes, revealing and concealing where one, yes, yes, okay, so we're getting warmer here in that sense that, so on the one hand, keep thinking about the hovering moments of speaking and writing, and on the other hand, as it were, the other aspect is this thing called the pharmacon. Okay. The essay comes from the book Dissemination, which um, I think in the dialogue, um, Socrates talks about um, how something, how so speech, for example, brings fruit. It's productive. It's it's an insemination, you know, biologically productive. And the marginalised, and the opposite to that is the wasteful, something that doesn't produce meaning, the, which is dissemination. So masturbation, sex without, you know bearing fruit, an example. And so he's going to, so Derrida tries to tease back these repressed and marginalized uh, things, the sensual, all the dirty stuff that goes along with it, back into play with the other forces of work, which in Plato's pharmacy is that logos. And mm -hmm. um, I suppose I sort of uh, relate this to Freud in which he tries to tease out the sensual and sexual from the unconscious which is obviously marginalised from the conscious because if, if unconscious at sensual it's sort of conscious. So, so the unconscious is not marginalised, the unconscious just isn't. Good, yeah. You know, which is slightly different. Mm. It's not it's not the other in that sense. The unconscious is like a whole it's like saying that your foot is marginalised from the head. It's not really. You know, um, it's just it's a totally different Maybe you know the, the sofa and the table, they're not marginalized from each other, they're just not each other. But what are you trying to say with that then? What, what do you really mean? To, what, what's the link that you're trying to draw? Then? Um, just that how the sensual can be sort of teased back into, into play, but without going back to the same old problem of putting. Of, same opposites with one thing over another. So, say with, um, I think he talks about it in a different way. Uh, if you if you play the same old game, the power structures. If you if you take out the fascist movement at the top, the only thing they can replace it is another movement. I mean, neither be as bad, but it's still the same structure. If you want to sort of change the game, as it were, you can't just Placing things, you've got to tease things out, bring them into play, without them becoming, you know. So, the, so you're saying that the point of the pharmacon is to realize how something is 
multiple in order that it can have openings so that a play can get started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a space in, in which it can move, in that instability, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And so that instability is what is often under the title deconstruction. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the whole movement of structuralism and then later on deconstruction comes, it emanates, as it were, or let's say it can be clarified via the pharmacon. That's what I say, yeah. So. Excellent. <laughs> Very good thing. Okay, so go on. Uh, Which so. just, sorry to, sorry for that point, but so when you hear the term deconstruction, while it is not inaccurate to say that things can be taken apart, that's not the point of deconstruction. The point is to see how its constitutive, that, that it's that how its assemblage allows for how something can be played. And the play is to be able to create a repetition that can set up something that doesn't repeat the same. Can I, can I sorry to interrupt, but ask a kind of slightly out of out of context question, but um, would you, would you say that the notion of fractals has a kind of similar, similar function to that of deconstruction? Which is rather than kind of establish formal patterns, is to reveal impossible complexities. Yes, that's exactly the point. And in fact, um, not that you should um, now go off and publish this because I'll kill you then. But <laughs> But um, yes, that, that not only is the point, but more to the point is that, in certainly in the way I'm using fractal philosophy, is that the patterns are not symmetrical patterns. So a camouflage is a pattern. Um, and that the problem is, is that mathematically, people are not very, um, let's say, advanced mathematically. Um, they're, they're at best into the philosophers and uh, understand the arithmetic, but they don't necessarily understand physics, and it, as a result, the way in which one understands patterns is often as this kind of uh, the same being repeated. But it's not the same that's being repeated. What's being repeated is the process that can repeat. And that process can always throw up a multitude of differences. In fact, a fractal, that is what it throws up as difference. So, um, so that's, so the thing is, is that people often go off on the tangent of the mammal brought move to talk about fractals and how things get smaller, 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 a leaf or whatever the example is they give. But in fact, it's much more on this, it's about how the complexity is actually a very elegant, simple algorithm. Mm -hmm. it, it, the complexity isn't really about how complex you can get it. I mean, how, how obscure you can get it. There's a, there's a, a book, a, a brief introduction to chaos, and um, one of those kind of series is it, of- uh, Gen Genio or whatever it is. Yeah, it's one of those, um, Oxford University kind of short guides. I mean, they're, they're, they're small, but they're usually very dense and mm -hmm. very far from being a uh, simple introduction, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, th that was a bit of a light bulb moment for me when um, I, I read that and, and it said such a thing with these very, very, very simple um, algorithms, so in other words, rules. Mm -hmm. uh, and they drew lines saying, right, that, well, this is, this is a kind of, you know, through the, through the number number bank. Mm -hmm. This is the pattern through the number bank that is generated by this this simple rule. So that's the rule. Mm -hmm. And you get you get like number spirals that would go like this and mm -hmm. sort of back into negative numbers and end up you know, go to huge numbers and then back down into very small Or imaginary functions. numbers which you have more fun. Um, and it was <laughs> and it was yeah it was really uh, I mean you say precisely the same thing which you yeah. but it was it was there and I was like well, well, yeah, I never really thought about it in terms of those kind of like, you know, simple rules and simple methods. So I thought yeah, it might be a bit much for Sorry? The complexity is also for simplicity. Yeah. 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 If you look at the result of all the starting group experience. I mean, why was it originally called complexity? Does anybody know? No, I'm just thinking. Yeah, yeah. And why would that be complex? Well, I thought Plexman's Good, good. <laughs> Very good.
good. Okay. So it's not really complexity versus simplicity. Yeah. So that's very good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So again, the idea that no one single bee can dominate as soon as one bee from the bomb kind of appears, it disappears and replaces it with another one, the poison, medicine, they stuff. They're always there. No meaning ever. There's no arrival of a single meaning. They're always moving. There's no pure concept which can stick to it. Um, there's always yeah. There's always a trace of what's gone before or what's coming. Then like how there's something that haunts thoughts with Freud. How some how the unconscious sort of haunts the conscious. And how it gets into this respect of Marx. Yes. What's this haunting business? This, how something. You're going to be called on next grace. So <laughs> how. <laughs> I just read it. This you know, that there's no pure thought, even from the very first thought, there's something which. There's a trace in there, there's something which isn't. Which. Which may not manifest itself, but it's still there. It's. What does it imply when, when something's haunted? <laughs> If you say that something, if you go into a haunted house, what are you supposed to feel? A presence. And unless you're a medium, you're going to be slightly, I would think, upset about it. Or, no? Has anybody ever been in, a, in what you would consider to be a haunted house? Or a haunted environment? <laughs> Got me. <laughs> well, I have, um, two, twice actually. Uh, the first time was when I was in Brighton. I was staying at uh, these people who are museum collectors. I say that in the most generous sense, in case you're watching this, because they did seem to collect things from museums as opposed to give them to museums. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> 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 and the house had a lot of shrunken heads in it. Um, hello, in case you know exactly who I'm talking about. And we're talking not like one or two shrunken heads. You know what a shrunken head is. It's a real head that's little. Um, now that's an interesting process in and of itself, <laughs> just just an aside. But and uh, because I was, you know, a very poor student, I had nowhere to stay. I was staying in Brighton. They said you can stay at our house, but there's just one thing you need to understand, and that is that the house is haunted, and uh, you just have to be okay with that. You know, either that you're secular, you don't believe in haunted, or you do believe in haunted, and you're not going to be freaked out about it. So I was like, yeah, whatever. You know, <coughs> it's whatever. Show me the beach. You know, it's like I mean, it's fine. It's Brighton. And um, then the night came, and it was creepy. Because, of course, you're thinking, there are all these heads on these shelves everywhere. There were like hundreds of shrunken heads. And, um, you know, they do play a little bit of a trick on your head, on your mind, if you're, you know, if you're not believing that they're actually speaking to you. So I decided to throw a party with pizza. And I invited uh, one or two other people over that had bodies attached to the heads. And I invited all the heads. And we put all the heads around, which I think that some of them didn't like being moved, but I couldn't help it. So around the pizza, I can now never eat pizza. <laughs> around the pizza were all these heads. And we party all night. In the morning, I put all the heads back, of course, and where I thought they belonged. Um, but anyway, um, and this went on. I would have some kind of party every night where I bring out the various heads because then I made decisions, too many heads to keep bringing back and forth. And, uh, and then, you know, I was done and I wrote a little thank you note. Uh, and uh, when the people came back, they said, you know, did you have any issues with this? And I said, not at all. They said, well, didn't you feel nervous? And I said, well, no, but, you know, we all partied <laughs> together. And they thought I was completely nuts. <laughs> like the, the, uh, you know, now, you are the only other person I know that could understand this sentence. Okay. <laughs> so, have you ever had a haunted moment? Um, well, the only place that I felt that was a horribly haunted is... Woodchuck. Horribly haunted as opposed horribly. to positive, ha positively haunted. <laughs> it has a bit of a horrible word, but it's Woodchester Man. Um, it's a, it's, it is derelict, but it's supposed to be the most haunted place in Britain. Oh, right. But um, it's not actually the house that I found was kind of quite creepy. There's a boat house that's just outside a wood, which is surrounding it. Um, and it's not really open to the public. You have to kind of go outside of the grounds for it. But it just... There you have to climb stuff. over a fence and yeah. <laughs> pull your stuff. But yeah, it's just... Um, it's, very, it's a very kind of unsettling vibe around there. And it's the only place that I've ever been where I wouldn't want to stay on with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm, I'm quite reasonably interested in it. I'm, stuff doesn't normally bother me like that, but it's... 
that it could have a bit of a, an atmosphere that you couldn't explain. So the idea of haunted means that there's a spirit of some kind mm -hmm. or a presence of some kind, right? So if you use the word haunted, it's not, an, again, it's not an innocent word. It's not like he's saying trace. I mean, he is saying trace, but he's saying a certain kind of trace, a trace that gives you a tremble, gives you a shiver, gives you a goosebump somehow, or whatever you call it over here. Um, so and nobody else has had this experience? Barnaby, I can't believe it. No, no, no. Uh, but, but your heads, are, are they not reliquaries, reliquaries of the of the people who once had them? Are they, are they not repositories of their of their spirits? Well, I guess. Because then, then what you were doing is, um, because because spirits, spirit, well, no, no, <laughs> on the, no, on the contrary, you are um, the absolute reverse. Because the spirits are known to have no, no, absolutely, I, I, I agree. Junky tastes, yeah, you know, yeah. like kind of pizza and um, alcohol and Coca Cola. I didn't realize that part. No, 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 I, no I, I just was my, you know, white trash me. You know, I've been so in, I, that's um, what I had. I've been in Mexico and I went to a Catholic church, which was, there, and there was a, a couple of women sacrificing a chicken, and um, as you do, and uh, and the spirits there, apart from liking live blood. Um, or maybe it's chicken flesh, but uh, they also like um, tequila and Coca-Cola. Not, not together. They just like kind of so you pour the tequila for the spirits. So they like Coca-Cola sounds like a fairly recent interpretation. I just don't think they're that discriminatory. You're just saying, you know, for eternity. Like... You're not going to start saying Coca-Cola. Oh, well, I don't know. This is a bit new. Um, they have really junky tastes, and they love cigarettes. And uh, uh, I. <laughs> I do, I do know, I do know, um, regrettably, people who practice voodoo in there or whatever they want to call it, because it's not really called that, it doesn't have a name. No. Um, but it's common to um, light cigarettes in the corner of e each corner of the room um, for the spirits, and uh, then then they have something to drink, whatever's, whatever's going really, but you know, whatever's whiskey, Coca-Cola, well, you were in Japan recently. Did you go to Kyoto or any of the I did, shrines? Yeah. No, I didn't go to Kyoto, but I did go to the Meiji Jinju shrine. And, um, and there's lots of presents that they give people. Or yeah, yeah, spirit parcels, and money. Money. You know, money, like I said, you know, really kind of, they have really kind of proletarian tastes in stuff. So pizza would have gone down really <laughs> yeah. well. And, and, and that's quite a sophisticated food stuff in Brighton, I understand. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is something I'm actually thinking of recently. In life, what we are studying. Um, I, it happened to me a couple of times to hear voices of people I know who died. Mm -hmm. um, very vivid, the voice in the, room, in the next room, or waking me up. Um, and it's, it's, it's strange because it's people I know, it's not people that I'm shouldn't be scared, I'm not scared. And then I've gone back to all those we have very freaking and the long gone, the long past rejection of philosophy, the philosophy had towards mystical and the beyond as another place. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> bringing the two things together, is the, 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 what I'm thinking past the emotions of this event is, um, is are we just living in, a, in a, or projecting for ourselves the, the field, the pattern of the environment that has left out something else. And that, that something else is not unreal. It's not, um, it, it is very difficult to describe, because the, all the language, all the terminology, always has to refer to it as something which is not what is. It, it constantly mm -hmm. has to skirt around the issue. But it seems that the problem is set precisely because there has been a line drawn, and these things have been left out. These things, whether they are the spirits of people that have passed away or anything else. But something has been left out, and therefore we don't even have a language to speak about it, mm -hmm. actually. I won't say it's precisely the language that I've become. And rather than bit by bit approaching or kind of sort of digging up the mountain with a teaspoon, one should say, well, let us embrace it all in one go. And that that is beyond, and that which is here is it's not the same, but it's, it's a continuum. Okay, but it's not a continuum. This, it's is, not, this, it's not a this continuum. is what's very crucial. I'm glad you raised it because it's not—it's it, not like there's a big pot outside of which there is 
no, uh, nothing else, right? I mean, it's not, not even like there's nothing outside, you know, it's not like here is philosophy and then outside, or here is how we understand things, and then sort of, sort of on the margin is where, um, or the, these kind of marginal things here is where, let's say, the, the haunted al alchemy, you're, you're doing alchemy in your thesis, you know, the way in which alchemy is the precursor to philosophy, of course. Uh, this notion of change, changing metals into, you know, gold or, you know, Christianity or whatever it is. It's sort of swipe the church. Oh, yeah. I've crushed that the word haunted, yeah? Yeah, because, well, j just, just to, so you get a sense that this, this field that's being set up isn't a continuous field in the notion of a linear sense of continuity. No, but it is as, when physics speaks of dark matter, Already, the fact that they name it dark matter, it says it's the other side of something. It isn't the other side of it. Right. It's the same side. Right. It's, it's acting in a way to it can be a measure calculated. Right. It. But it is here as the light matter. Right. This is what I mean by it, if it makes sense. Yes, okay, as long as you're not seeing it as one continuous field that like has like, you know, you know, right wing, left wing, no, no, you no, know, no, like no, some no, sort no. of field but like that. The, the problem is that it, it is con conceiving or conceptualizing it as something that it, it, it is it's not a beyond. It's part of the same gravity field. Mm -hmm. And uh, if anything, there are multiple positions rather than just two. But, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is one and the other that has created the problem of the unbridgeability of the of, 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 of beyond. That's true. But I'm just worried about the way in which you're understanding multiplicity here. So let's mm -hmm. just keep that, let's go to ontology and then we'll go back. Yes? Me. Yes, I, please. I just want to say, uh, the word for haunted in that is from that, that line from that progress of 68, yeah? At that time, we went haunted down the haunted ghost line, but surely there's a literal figure of sense of haunted. When you say somebody's haunted, I mean, um, there's a kind of, I can almost see what you mean, you know, there's a kind of visual to it, or someone's haunted. It's um, and at that time, I would have thought a lot of people used they were haunted because it's not 60, it's only 20 years after the end of the war kind of thing. And there's a lot of people around them days who've been through that kind of thing. Your bus driver had been out in Africa, your busher had landed here, there, and there. So haunted feel at that time isn't just haunted, and it's, I mean, to me, it's the kind of yeah. to me. It's, oh, it's, absolutely. It's another kind of haunting going and in on fact, in that feel. In fact, the haunting usually was referring to the specter of either communism or the spe specter, yeah. uh, you know, as in this ghost coming up, this, the specter of uh, Marxism, the specter of communism, the specter of fascism, this kind of thing, a residue of some kind that hasn't gone away, that hasn't died, yeah. that, that can't find its resting place, and as a result is still kind of marching around doing something, you know, and yes, that's very important. So, so he's bringing us in politically to to make one aware of the way in which the materiality of something that isn't yet gone still presents itself somehow. Okay. The Master. There's a film last year, excellent film with um, uh, by Paul Thomas Anderson. Just saw it. Uh, it's it's fairly recent. It's called uh, The Master. Called The Master. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It has um, Joachim Phoenix Phoenix in it as a mm -hmm. as a Pacific War veteran coming back to post post war United States and. Being haunted. I mean, in the sense that you just uh, just articulated. Fantastic film. Mm. Philip Seymour Hoffman is mm. a. Um, I suppose I would I'd describe him as a kind of maybe Reichian figure. Um, mm. A sort of uh, he's the master of the title, but it's not a kind of. What's interesting about the film is that it's not a. It's not a kind of. This sort of haunted ex serviceman doesn't fall into the into the kind of hands of a cult figure of a religious cult figure but a psychoanalytic mm -hmm. kind of um, sort of sort of floats around really in this kind of in the but in very very sort of fifties and and there's a kind of that element of that incredibly gullible mm. sort of fifties society. But it it's a superbly constructed film because nothing the things on look at it at the library. Yeah, it's a it's um nothing's quite sort of Completely totemic. Everything sort of slips between poles, and uh, and uh, it's fabulously subtle. Huh. And um, and it was made last year. Yeah, 2012, USA. Huh. Paul Thomas Anderson, director. 
Um, okay. Should have won the best Oscar. But then we gave it to Argo. Argo. I like Argo though. Yeah, but like. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I like Argo. No, I mean, I didn't mean it in that pants sort of way. Yeah. <laughs> I meant that I thought it was a, I thought it was I liked it. I was surprised that Ben Affleck actually did an interesting film. <laughs> actually, yeah, no, I think we were. I think everyone was, and that's why I got the Oscar. People were shocked. Yeah, I know. My God, he pulled it off. Okay, let's go back to this. Right, yeah, so that idea of the presence, um, where something has presence in the present because it has meaning. I guess this idea of the transcendental signified how a pen has meaning because the idea of the pen is, sig well, is signified in the, pen, in the present moment. It has that presence. And so there it is. We have the difference is talking about a non concept, a non present, something which can't be sort of grasped in the present because it doesn't have a meaning, a stable concept within which to place itself, put it on the spatial temporal grid. There's the, yeah, it's just completely unstable, that sort of sense, it can't be grabbed. Mm -hmm. um, so, start up with this quote on page 63. A text is not a text unless it hides from the first cover. So that's from the Pharmacon, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, from dissemination. Mm -hmm. Okay. From the first cover, from the first glance, the law of its com composition and the rules of its game. Can you start again? Sorry about that. A text is not a text unless it hides from the first cover. From the first glance, the law of its composition and the rules of its game. A text remains, moreover, forever imperceptible. Its laws and its rules are not, however, harbored in the inaccessibility of a secret. It is simply that they can never be booked in the present into anything that could rigorously be called a perception. So I think when he talks about this text, he doesn't just mean writing or speaking, it just means. Well, it could be anything like whatever, anything that... That does what? That where, where meaning tries to assert itself, where a meaning tries to bring itself forward as... So where meaning could mean a coherence is established. True. Where it tries it doesn't to... Have to be, <clears throat> I mean, it doesn't have to be true. It just has to be um, able to withstand a moment, however long the moment is. So that's why coherence and not truth. And he's, he's heading, he's sort of heading towards introducing a similar of the text to the text. Yes, good. You want to say that again? So, so that he's he's get moving that. towards introducing a similar of the text to the text. So he's started to tease out that rightful space. I mean, I know there's a different word for it which we haven't got onto, but there's that separation that, you know, that it's not all, everything's not, everything's not in the text. Right. For Derrida. Right. But isn't there a, a, a narrative here of something? I don't know if it is nice, but anyway, what I hear in, in throughout all these authors of the, uh, the French one especially, although they, are, they pretend not to, but they, they, seem, they seem to identify um, presence or ability to make sense with body, with physical presence. Therefore, what is not physical presence is problematic. Obviously, what is not physically present has a huge impact. But wait, when you say physically present, do you mean materially present? So when you say materially present, do you mean could a sound could um, could something that can't be seen or touched or heard be considered material? From this well, perspective? It, the problem I am trying to figure out is that it seems to me that they, they do not recognize something can be something that escapes perception is not material. There, there is a double problem there because they are seeing that which escapes perception as non material the full problem. And at the same time, they are reasoning from the point of view of thought and logos, which is not perceptual, not perceptual, or whatever you want to While it is obvious in our minds that there are plenty of things that are not physically perceptible, 
have a huge impact on us. Financial economies, uh, emotions, um, gravity, touch gravity, you can't. Yeah. So are you suggesting that the French are suggesting, um, the French in the broad strokes here, are suggesting that something like gravity is not material? Is, I I'm just trying to get a sense of what you yes, I mean, mean like, by I, I, have, I have this impression, unless I am greatly misunderstanding the whole thing, is that uh, the, the, sort of the, uh, behind the head there is this, this division um, between what is material and what is not, and they are trying to take back what is material without, in a way that, at least with the language they are using, doesn't really bring it back, because it's always like, unsayable, they're ungraspable, they're, there's always defined for the term negative, why it is as present, as active as, as, as we are in us. As, um, uh, Anybody want to respond to that? Because I think that was uh, a yeah. very serious charge. I um, was thinking maybe something a little different in the sense, uh, when you talk about um, speaking, um, speaking and uh, the writing, speaking, um, there's the speaking out, and then there's the what they call the inter interpersonal, and there's the intrapersonal, which is the speaking to yourself, as it were, uh, or doing you know, that kind of uh, internal dialogue. And I wasn't quite sure how that was being, if it was even being differentiated within how it differentiates within in, in Derrida's text in dissemination of. Like, if, like in terms of the way in which he uses voice. It does in the tympan. He, he, there's a sentence where yeah. he talks. He talks about the voyage, the voyage beyond. I mean, to, I think that. Sorry to, to, to make my own, to make a sense for, of myself. I think Matthias got a very interesting point. This concept of the material versus the, the non-material, and the, there seems to be a paradox in in Derrida where he wants everything to be. Um, insubstantial but at the same time there's this kind of reduction to limits but I don't think it's unique to Derrida I mean I think that you have similar things in um, in uh, Christ who were we just reading we read a fortnight ago um, in, no, no, in, no. Um, the, the, the worst point is that but, but, hang on, hang on but he, he I, think that, I think there's this kind of paradox and this is where the notion of the limit limit is is Really starts to kind of assert itself. I, I think he's he's particularly aware of it. And in um, the Timpan, he talks about the, the the escape from the interior, the voyage into the world, and then the return into the. So he he and he he marks that. I think it's that he he offers up the Timpan as tympanic membrane as this kind of site of um, finitude. Not finitude. Um, well, a limit. Of a limit. Yeah. A limit. A limit of self. A limit of you know of self uh, of, of the primal, if you like. And the the language kind of escapes, goes it, and goes into the world, offers itself up, and then and then returns. And I think he 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 knows he's, he he understands precisely what you're saying that there's this dichotomy um, between. The, the out there and the in there, the interiority and the exteriority. Um, I, I wish I could find the, uh, there, but it's it, but it's there in um, it's there in Timpan, and it's one of the most precise in anything I've ever read. It's one of the most precise kind of cognitions or recognitions of this this very distinct um, limit limit of self, the the interior and the uh, and the exterior. Which he, he measures in the kind of lang the hearing of language and the, the tour, the tour of self as you put the words out out there and, and hear your own speech. I think he's talking about it as well. Yeah, I just to just to make one little tiny inroad onto that, which I think is uh, quite a useful way that you uh, put that. But the voice, while it is let's say interior and then it goes out interior uh, exterior, is still a voice, and so it doesn't escape the uh, trauma of language, whether or not it's being said to oneself or being said aloud. So just be careful of the way in which the circulation, the economy of that circulation goes, mm. because he's not trying to, uh, let's say, give greater status to if it's out outside in the world or inside, because it's all soci socially constructed. It's a, it's a constitutive assemblage. Is that what your question was going to be? 
Okay, so Dane. Okay. Um, if you really can't, you can really wear them. There is a lots of text. You can. Okay, great. Okay, go on. You can perhaps read it as context, as a moment, that sort of sense, but you know, you know, context as the sort of the subjective perception, you know, fall into that sort of trap. So if you're really careful, you can do, you can read the word text. As context. With text. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? So how can you read, how, if, let's say I'm being really careful. I'm not sure what I'm being, how I'm able to now not read it as, as exactly what you're saying not to do. <laughs> um, because context, how, how are you meaning context then? As, as this moment in a moment in the present. So the simulacra of the moment. So Where? the text is the simulacra of the moment. Right, so the, present. the text is both has present. the simulacra of the moment and the moment. Mm. So you could drop the text and have the simulacra. You could drop the original, as it were, yeah. and have the pharmacon. Yeah, Which is not standing in for the text. It's a simulacra of the text. Mm. Um, quote here from, what, where? from Plato's Pharmacy. Okay. Um, he's talking about the, the pharmacon. He says, if the pharmacon is ambivalent, ambivalent, it is because it constitutes the medium in which opposites are opposed, the movement and the play that links them among themselves, reverses them and makes one side cross over into the other soul body. Good, evil, inside, outside, memory, forgetfulness, speech, writing, etc. It's on the basis of this play or movement that the opposites or differences are stopped by Plato. The pharmacon is the movement, the locus, and the play, the production of different. It is the difference of different, holding, reserve, etc., etc. Sure. Yeah. You're probably going to get to that. What yeah. page is on? That would have been, uh, it's in the section two, from Plato's pharmacy. So, No, no, the bit you're reading from, page 27, oh. page 1, so this is going to be completely different, there's a, there's a, there's a whole outwork at the front here, which will... Uh, yeah, I think from now on, all of us must promise each other that we write with sections, <laughs> so it doesn't matter what page it's on, this is crazy. Um, anyway. You have it? Well, we read this one, and didn't get onto that one, okay. so unfortunately... That's right, so go... No, no, that's great. Go on, Dan. Okay. Um, so he take, takes a critical look at this idea of writing, reading as one. Uh, to read is to write. If you read something, read some writing, you give it meaning, you project meaning onto it. You're not dealing with the text in that sort of regard. You just putting your own meaning onto it, you're, you're augmenting it, you're adding on to it. And the Derrida is an example with the woven texture. The, the scene won't hold it when it's, a, it's just on top, it'll just fall away mm -hmm. when you leave it. Um, <coughs> and this idea of adding on the supplement you know, deals with that with uh, Rousseau, doesn't it? The idea of supplements like Pharmacon mean two different things, it means something that's, that can be added on to a completed system, augments it, or it can make the system complete. Mm -hmm. So it's supplementing it, it's got that two different meanings of it. 
which again destabilised what Rousseau was saying in was. So the question of the supplement, for example, if you even think of a vitamin as a supplement, uh, on the one hand, it's not meant to be in place of food. It's not meant to be in addition to food, but it will make the system fully itself, and hence it's supplement. I mean, I know it's a terrible way of doing it, living, but maybe it's... it's, 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 it's Bernard Steiger, Bernard Steiger? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think he would talk about the supplement as being um, tertiary memory, third memory, outside of cells, the technology, in fact. Mm -hmm. so I think that's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. towards. So, yeah, that's another That's a very good point. But you see, that's precisely what I meant before, because it's, it is an issue of metaphor for things that are not. We are obviously defined also by the, the technology, or as Tiger says, the memory that is stored in the technology, now patterns of habits and views and culture that now are not. But now, as plus the new mobile super fancy phones or computer, are obviously different app than what we were 30, 40 years ago with a land mm -hmm. uh, just to make a very banal example. Um, so this idea that that third me th the tertiary, tertiary memory is a supplement is still reasoning from the point of view that we are one at the end of our fingertips, and then other things come along. And I don't know to it. I, I just no, really I think that that's mis understanding this situation. Uh, I say that respectfully, but no, I think no, it's no, this is why I'm so because, confused about it. Because he, uh, it's not that the body ends with the finger in this mm -hmm. sense, um, and then outside there's mm -hmm. this supplement that you can tack on, like you know, putting on gloves or something like that, or putting on extra something. But rather that the system that creates the, the, the senses mm -hmm. doesn't re necessarily require the confines of the body. It requires it, it, it. It's 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 a social. It has a sociality to it. Yes. Therefore, the body isn't where it ends. Yes. That, 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 okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I'm not sure what the. But then maybe I just misunderstood the way Mark phrased that. The well, I, I'm not. I, I'm not sure. I agree. I I think that I don't think that's that what the whole of what he's saying. I think that he. I think you don't agree with what. That I think to a to an extent. He is saying the body is the, 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 not, not the fingertips, but in this case, it's the tympanic membrane. But I think he is saying. But that's that, very important to understand that that, that anyway, it's a membrane as opposed to. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But I, mean, I think he's saying he's saying two things. First of all, the, the, the body is where it ends, and um, to an extent, and that's where we start to establish the distance between uh, the body, the outer reaches of the body. The other side of that barrier is interiority. We start to, uh, the other side of the body is exteriority and in the exterior somewhere is the simulacrum, um, the distance between this is kind of different, you know, and it's an experiences, which is introducing the notion of an experience distance, um, temporal, temporal uh, aspect, which we haven't got onto yet. But um, the, 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 but it's not quite as simple as there's the comp there's the end of the body and, and stuff because it is it is a membrane so it is that means it's by implication it's vibrating in and out that means the distance is destabilized. But to put it slightly differently, there is there are limits. Mm -hmm. It's just not the limit as one would usually set up a limit, like the end of the fingertip and then where you go. Mm -hmm. But rather that the organicity of a limit is what's being put under the challenge. The fact that it is actually a living limit, that, that it's a breathing limit, that it's a, you know, it's a, or it's a tympanic limit, if you want to put it like that, mm -hmm. is where he's going with this. So it's not that you have this, he's not, when, when he says he's critiquing the Rousseauian moment, it's, it's, what he's doing is critiquing this notion of the individual that joins society or takes itself, in this particular example, mm -hmm. takes this, yes. But besides all this, on, on this edition is on page 82. Which edition is that edition? Um, of the dissemination. But I mean, just continuum. Yes. Okay. So it would be, if the second paragraph, the pattern logos is here, is one page. Oh, uh, what show is it again? Is this in Farmcom? No, yes. Yes, it's a Platos Pharmacy, paragraph 2, the pattern logos. Starts up from the page, so the beginning of the third page after that. 
the, the paragraph starts, not that Logos is the Father, be that. What would say an Akhurana chronically that the speaking subject is the father of his speech? And one will quickly realize that this is no metaphor, at least not in the sense of any common convention of effect of rhetoric. Logos is a son, then, a son that would be destroyed in, in, its, in his very presence without the present attendance of the father, which I think is very important. A son that would be destroyed in its presence and without the present attendance of the father. His father who answers, his father who speaks for him and answers for him. Without, it, without his father, he would be nothing but, in fact, writing. At least that is what, um, what is said by the one who says, it is the father's thesis. The specificity of writing would thus be intimately bound to the absence of the father. And then he continues. But now, when he says that logos, live speech, would decay into writing, and then there is this game of metaphors. Or not metaphors. Or not, or not metaphors. So it's the, the, the problem. The, 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 fact that the, the fact that there must be something else, the father, which is in this case, like the first thing in the Plato was made, was the father of the gods, the king of the gods, guaranteeing the legitimacy of um, the meaning of the text once it had written and no longer being spoken. And if this goes away, you know, if the father is not present, the text counts for nothing, becomes a simulacrum. Um, I, think, I think he's, uh, this, this may be a bit of a controversial reading, but I think he's also punning on the translation of the word son in English, although he's writing in French. Actually, is he writing in French? Yes. Yeah. Is this text he wrote in English, is it? No. Um, and I think he knows that the sun, you know, is the, which is the same word as sound in French. In English, sun is son is son is. Um, and I think that he's 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 playing on this idea of uh, engendering. It's a different word. I know it's a different word, but I think he's aware of what he's what he's doing. Is this engendering? Is this the text engendering speech? Is the father and the son uh, relationship in English? I think I think he's aware of that. I, I, I haven't got any evidence to suggest. No, no. That. I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I don't want to necessarily get to the discussion. Is this, of is this kind of language? Is this sort of issue? Is, is still this issuing forth? And I think that he's still he's. It goes back to what you're saying. He's he's aware of this this idea of a limit. And yes, it's inconvenient. This idea of a barrier. Barriers usually are inconvenient. And yes, there's this ideal, which is this kind of. Uh, uh, Effervescence, this sort of you know everything, everything fluid and uh, and and moving, but we still we still have to acknowledge the fact that there's this terminosity to our experience of, of self, and he's really he's really he keeps inserting he keeps inserting this as a as a limit. It's a limit that is transgressed by. The, the movement, the My movement mind. of speech. You know, well, I mean, in this in, in this particular text, he's talking about he's talking about uh, language and sound, and he's really, I think, he's really playing with the um, with the, the tympanic membrane by passing language through it from the interior to the exterior and vice versa. You know, there's, there's also yeah, no, there's no, also no, another no, that, that membrane in your. So you know, I, I, I believe I understand that. I think, and I think he's doing, I think, and I think this is a pun. I mean, maybe I'm over reading the text. No, if anybody can over read it, there, it could, it, there could be the pun. Let's say, I mean, that, that's not necessarily not acceptable. But is that your question? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's my question. But it was a very interesting. Uh, thank you. Bad question. It's more <laughs> it's <just speciality>. lovely. <laughs> what I, I want to say is that to, to rephrase my doubt about the problem, the, the way the problem is posed. Uh, it might be just a misunderstanding. <clears throat> From my position as an artist, I would have really be too concerned about the fact that language is or isn't rooted in some real terms somewhere. 
I rather use the words, the grammar, and the very problem that it might or might not be rooted in the real truth somewhere as my material. And uh, that's all part of the same dough I see in my hand, mm -hmm. or the same surface I am working on, right. part of, rather than distancing it to these different hierarchized layers of that that seem to appear here. Does it make more sense? No, yeah, I think that um, if, if I could maybe situate it and therefore properly say something very different, but I think what you're suggesting is, I think what you're hearing is that what Derrida is suggesting, is what Matthias is hearing Derrida suggesting, mm -hmm. is that this notion of the field, of that which has mm -hmm. materiality, has different, let's say, forms of materiality when the body becomes present. And you're objecting to that, saying that that which is outside the body or inside the body, with the body being, let's say, even if it's a tympanic membrane, mm -hmm. that, that that, what you're hearing is that that materiality that's, quote, outside the body mm -hmm. is being um, judged or, or somehow having a different relation to the material that you could be using anywhere. And as an artist, you're using yes. whatever lays to hand, yes. including what's inside, outside, yes. inside, above, so whatever. As an artist, I don't see this hierarchy of depth. Well, but you see it as a hierarchy of depth. You see that what he's suggesting is a hierarchy of depth. Yes, while, while I, I don't take it as a hierarchy, but it's all on the same plane. Right. And I would say that he's not suggesting there's a hierarchy of death. Mm -hmm. So I need to understand why you think he's saying that. OK, maybe I, I'm just hearing no, no, too no, much. I, I'm hearing too much virtuality of Deleuze here, which I Well, I mean, I'm, I, there are many issues that I have with Derrida, which I've been trying to not raise, <laughs> because I don't want to basically get my view in here. However, I do think that it's important to just hear how he's developing this notion of the materiality of language. Because when you think about it, where does language reside? Does it reside in your head? Does it reside outside your body? Does it reside, you know, I don't know, in the books? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> you know, so, so what does that do to have yes to all of those things? It's quasi-transcendental. That's what he gets at later. But, but in the sense that it's the, he's, he's questioning the role of language. He's not questioning the role of the body here. He's questioning the role of how language operates in philosophy. And that the, the difficulty is, is that one needs to get a different sense, as it were, literally, a, a hearing sense to language, a, a, an aural sense to language rather than either the logo sense of language or uh, the type, the, the way in which uh, language ends up creating different forms of game. So he wants to get away from the language game. He's not Wittgensteinian either. You know, so he's, he's, he's trying to make a comment of how language is able to penetrate all sorts of bizarre environments, the body, the book, culture, you know, whatever. And so it's taken as a starting point in philosophy. And he's saying, here's what the problem is. Because actually, one needs to understand the materiality of this kind of movement that language has in order for one, to, and, and therefore the limits that language presents, in order to then rethink how experience, how opinion, how perception comes into the language, and therefore the body, and so on and so forth. Now you're suggesting from the Deleuzian move a very different way into the attack on the lang on the question of language. Um, no, no, I'm completely confused. Oh, I, I, I here I thought while. this was like completely <laughs> clear. <now>. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I was the rising to. Is that the timpani? In, in, in there, you are, you are, you are, you know, the therapeutic. You're, you're, you're in performance. So you're performing the philosophy. You're confused. That is the timpani. <laughs> I'm not sure I particularly agree. I think he's doing something a little simpler, and I think he's 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 using the, the notion of uh, limits and the body to embody 
both text and language, and then use the these actors um, in a actors mean text and language. Sorry. What do you mean by actors? I mean so th this embodied so text and language. Yes. Yeah. Two actors, uh, which are moving in relation to each other, but are in a, in the relation which is um, which is licensed by meaning or the or relative relative meaning in much the same way as the the um, they're also operating in uh, simulacra they're simulacra of each other I mean it's highly debatable is it outside of this remit to discuss which is you know which is primal which is even which is Don't even first yeah. but um he's 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 setting these things apart through through this artificial possibly artificial notion of notion of embodying both of them and um, in doing this, in 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 creating this notional space between them, he's he's recogn he's going to acknowledge the temporal notion of sound or spoke or speech of the spoken word, and he's going to contrast it with the the problematic of the text, which is that it's completely extant that it. You know, you have a book which is that's that's completely, completely finished, or you know, finished, and it's got its own terminosity. Yet, at the same time, it needs to be read, and therefore there's a kind of uh, you know, there's a it's, it's a twelve-hour project or whatever, whatever it happens to be. Um, so there's both there's both these approaches, and I think that he's going to, or what he, not he's going to, but what he does is is tease out these two notions. The temporal versus the um, this this not intact, like spatial, but yeah, yeah, intactness. This 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 imminence, if you like, the imminent book. Um, and in doing that, in, intro in, in interjecting that notion of temporal, he's going to introduce us to this is terms of difference. In that, it's not a equals a, which is just different, but his difference, which is the the same concept. But with a temporal notion uh, added into it, added into the mix, and and he's he's introducing the temporal stroke aural. Well, yes, the 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 aural is, I mean, is the kind of I, I mean, I think that he uses this as a as a device because it helps to secure the embodiment of the two uh, of the two concepts because we've got this we've got this notion of this. Well, this embodiment and the and the hour is almost becomes the kind of witness, the auditory witness of this whole of this whole project in this. In this yes, text. I mean that's true, but I mean it's it's not with the witness isn't to be discarded as it were. No, it's, but it's um well it's a, it's an auditor yeah. if you like. So so, that. but what I'm not, how is that? Um, I mean, you clarified it by adding text, but why would that be different than what I was suggesting? How do you see that? Um, what was the well, I think that, that I think that he's I think that he's, he's essentially he's trying to do something very simple, which is just to which is just to to kind of to to engineer a sort of model for his difference. You know, he's not trying to do anything too much more significant. But in doing so, I don't so I don't think he has any kind of grand designs on. Text and speech, um, other than um, what is fairly obvious that one takes time, or one and one doesn't. Sometimes takes time, and sometimes doesn't. You know, depending on how you want to look at things. Isn't there also a problem since you start to mention the grass? He is also in criticizing the primary position of speech over text. Um, that Plato has put forward, and that makes text appear just as a permanent copy of the more ephemeral speech. I think he says, no, there are things in text that cannot be said, and yet are problematic, and, and they go, they have an autonomous movement of it, they go to a different direction. Before text is not only <coughs> a copy, it's not, not only a copy of speech, it is something else, and actually, he seems to say it is the moment when text is established setting the old feeling we are in now. Um, um, 
Yes, so that the, the, the whole issue of temporal is turned around and it is basically looking at text or writing uh, as a more fundamental element. Um, so there is, it isn't that it's permanent what counts, but it's the fact that writing opens the, the horizon in a completely different way than the, the speech does. Yes, this you is say why. that. Yes, it is. that's not saying against, that's not, that, that you could certainly mm -hmm. make that argument, but that doesn't um, <coughs> challenge what Barnaby was saying, I don't think. Yeah, I, I, I No, probably not, I'm just trying to, I'm speaking on yeah, yeah, yeah. what yeah. I don't think, think he's, I don't think he's, I don't think he's coming down either side of, uh, there's, there's not, there's not a text versus speech thing going on here whatsoever. You know, it's just because he's separating out them. He's not saying, he's certainly not kind of saying, oh, if one has been privileged, I'm going to go the other way or whatever. I mean, there's obviously a, a, a long standing debate lasting several hundred thousand, several thousand years. I don't think he joins in that debate here. Um, you know, he's just recognizing that there are two, there are two separate things. One is, one is the text, and one is a, is an oral, an oral experience thing. Um, the only thing that I think is relevant to his point is that one is is temporal, or one is necessarily yeah, I think, temporal. I think, in the effort to be uh, clear, you, uh, it is important though that he does come down on the side of uh, the Britain. He, he does, and particularly in limited ink. I mean, maybe not so much in this particular okay. thing. Okay, well, I'm not saying that he doesn't join in that debate, but I'm just saying for the... No, for but the, he, le he leads on it, because it, the argument with Foucault, of course, was that Foucault was making the argument around speech. And the, you know, and the notion of the discourse was, of course, coming from the speech, the score to, to speak. And, and so there was a different mood that was afoot, and he was, you know, that was a very serious challenge to that. So by setting up this relation between language uh, or between text, let's say, and the language, the text in this sort of way that you're presenting it, he very clearly steps outside of the relation between speech and language, or speech and written, but gets into the aural. That's that's what's important here, as a, as a relationship between something that's happening in the text and is also with the speaking. So he so in the sense that he gets away from the, is it speech or is it uh, text? Is it, you know, what came first, the word or the, or the written word? Uh, he would say, well, the written word, if you want to really be clear about it, because what's happening in that text is precisely the way in which the aural and the language horizons start to manifest themselves. So then if you go into what you're saying, I mean, if you read a script and you want to see how it looked in the film, you would see that a lot of times you, what you read in a book doesn't at all appear in the film because what's, it's not translatable at that level. So he's saying that the text, something escapes in the text or something is added to the text or any, something makes the text a text much more coherently so than if, than if it were just read out loud. So, something else is going on in this, uh, in this environment. I think, I Small think, eye. Yeah. I, I think he... He, his, his notion of the arrow um, is, is where he, he really problematizes this notion of the, the, the limit and the embodied limit because he, he has this, this idea of awareness, conscious awareness, which is to hear one's own voice. Mm -hmm. And this is, the, I mean, this is the passing out uh, of speech and passing in mm -hmm. into the body, um, and I think for him this is the kind of this is the moment that you experience your embodied your embodied consciousness, mm -hmm. um, and this is the this is the problem of the uh, the the out there and the problem mm -hmm. of the embodied state. Um, I think it's a very good. Point. I think I think for him it's a, it's it is a it is a big it's a big. Problem. I think this is what he calls the, the putrid simulacra, did we say yeah, that? Yeah, the putrid, yes. It's like the putridness is, it's really fucking inconvenient, you know, um, from a theoretical perspective, that, that we still have these limits, you know, um, and there are these structures. And we, we perhaps wish that we could all have this kind of pure, pure 
thought or pure communication. Yeah, whatever, but yeah. It's, but it's not, it's putrid. Yeah. You know, there are putrid uh, aspects, and that's this. That's these limits which seem to be not, not insurmountable, but porous from a kind of porous, so, but still there. So if you circle back to the pharmacon then, this pharmacon and the way in which it is, in fact, then the putrid simulacra. Because that's why we're starting, that's why we're trying to sort of dig out what this pharmacon, pharmacon is getting at. So the pharmacon, which is not just that it's poison and also medicine, which is obviously, um, he starts off with that thing. As you've been developing it, it then gets into this, this complication. And the complication is that it's able to do more and do less at the same time and create a limit and a, and a passage at the same it time. Creates a fold. It? Creates a fold. Do you want to just, because I realize it, I, you're getting preempted there, so why don't you just say what you need to say on that? Um, um, it's just that it, it creates, a, it doesn't come caught by meaning in present. It, does, it talks a lot about the non-presence, something that can't be caused in the present. In the present, something has meaning there, something is established in the present. And something's absence. It doesn't have meaning, it's implied in things around you, say. Um, I've not got a pencil here, but I've got pens. And it, so that, that sort of thing would be established in what's present. I can establish anything that's not here in its absence through what's present, and that's something which talks about Saussure and the language of differences, how language is built on the difference, how a word and a letter is is given meaning because of what it's different from. It's a, so it, what's different from it, its network of relations, its meanings, it, it has no meaning in and of itself, but of what is around it, what it's different from. Sure about that. Can you repeat that again, just to make sure that? No. Um, are you suggesting that? I mean, are you? Did, I'm not sure if I heard you right. Um, but what I heard was that something is has a difference because it because it isn't what the surrounding scenario is. Well, that's what the issue. That's what Sassur is saying. Yeah. Oh, okay, right. I thought you said Derrida was saying. No, no, no. Okay, right. Derrida takes a bit of that, but he. And which bit does he take then? Uh. The. There's a. There's no meaning of itself to. There's a word text to another meaning of itself. It's built on those differences, but. There is differences. It's still something you can't ground. I mean, um, you can't ground it. You say? Go ground, ground, ground yeah. place. But I mean, question to the group then: Is it possible that something can have a meaning apart from its relative relation to the context that it's in? Can something have a meaning in and of itself? And if it could, what would that be? And if it can't, why not? So outside of history, you know, outside of differences, can there be a meaning of something? Can there be something that has a meaning that's not always already exposed by its relative position to something else? Mark, what are you going to say to that? Said that oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's well, I'm thinking of time mm -hmm. but I don't believe it, it exists. One can can postulate it, thought, but, um, and there might even be uh, moments in science that are, are taking things. As a, as a singularity. Don't you know? sing, do you singularity? Oh. <laughs> as, and they are singularity that has been postulated for a thousand years more is God, and obviously it's, it's, it's 
it useful, but... I'd say it's <laughs> important to no. check origin, but not singularity. No, I don't either. Oh, <laughs> see, now, now we're getting somewhere to the problem here. No, but this is why, this is, going back to the parameters, why is it called to bright in such a metaphorical way if you could get somewhere? The reason is somewhere we'll get to. It's You're just speaking the frustration of grace, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> why can't you just say what he's meaning to say? Um, isn't there something in the, in the talk, it's trying to get out of the, um, the logosphere, no, the, uh, the, the logos, the log, uh, you know, the, the logocentric. Yeah. The logos covers, you know, the word itself covers the whole panoply of the meaning. So if you say, just take Heidegger's discourse, the logos discourse, but the logos is also in the speaking out of things. And the speaking out is also the laying out in the later Bremen and Freiburg. And the speaking out of things is not the same as the writing of things, obviously. And the speaking out of things is, is in the presence of the things, at least, mostly. Um, and and that, that relation to the logos, or the, the logos is that speaking, that, that two doubles, as it were, is not the right, it's not fixed in writing. The, that the logos is that sense of the thing has its own identity, surely. That, is, that would be. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so he's challenging that. So, so, so the writing would be challenging that in mm -hmm. both a negative and a bad good. way. Um, uh, and what were we talking about? So we're talking about whether or not something, so, so to say that something is an assembled meaning, yeah. it's a deconstructed environment, you know, to say that there's always a constellation, as it were, that makes something real, or that its realness is the simulacra yeah. with or without copy, Texture language, and so on and so forth, and then I threw in the question, but I can retract retract the question if we're not ready to uh, hear the answer to that yet. Um, maybe I should. I'll retract the question. Can there be something that exists without it being in relation to something else? Exist or or as meaning? As meaning. Yeah, as meaning. Well, metaphor. I don't know why I'm saying that. Metaphor. metaphor. So it has an objective meaning. I'm going to retract this. It's, it's throwing people off. Yeah, I, I try. Is I, I, I roll this back. Is speculative What's that? Is it speculative metaphysics? This this kind of movement is with something that is that is not, you know, it's outside the human ken. Is this the, mm -hmm. the position that that that, 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 that philosophy takes that there is a real, but it's not real to us, as it were, kind of thing. Can you, can you know, those kind of questions. No, it's actually yeah. the question of whether or not. In this relation between, uh, let's say, the aural and the limit, that without placing those two yeah. in relation to other, can you have something that can be that can exist without yeah. both, without the aural? Can you have a singularity by which is not meant anything that that doesn't have a plurality to its singularity? Because the singularity, the way it's developed in complexity theory is always already multiple. So a singular moment isn't, it, it, it can be one-sided, but the one-sidedness is itself a multiple environment. So the speaking out of things, the aura part is the outside of, of the speaking out process that we engage with. Things. Which then becomes the inside, right? Because then you can yes, go yes, through yes, the tin pan, yes. right? But not okay. the inside of the thing. The thing not remains, the inside of the thing, right. The thing remains indifferent to okay. that. So, yes. Um, you know, we're still in relation with it. It's, it's kind of, just kind of, um, most things, but some things are called uh, people that would be, be different um, understanding. Because we, 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 re we relate to the aura. You know, we, we, we recognize the aura. In, yeah. In the thing, uh, some, some things may relate, but not recognize the, out, the outside of us. So we're not talking about, but just to be very clear, we're not talking about oral culture. Or oral. Yeah, aral. Aral. Yeah, aral. 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 Okay. Yeah. Want to continue? Uh, or are you done? No. No. Uh, so you're just on page two. <laughs> double, double well, page well, he said himself in the text that the first two pages, he says everything. He Wants to say. That's right. And so the rest of the you know, hundred pages is just playing about. I think it's just it's it's just just masturbation, masturbation really. Yeah. It just goes on just for pleasure, just for the hell of it. That is how to read Derrida. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> we 
you've got Barnaby on side. <laughs> and that's, that really is just how to read it, because he says what he needs to say, and it just so, but all these things are really actually really important. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just Lauren easy. is totally the champion. But it's just too easy, easy to sit and fight and get fights so, of like, oh, well, I'm just a master of enough or something. Else. But I think it's like, it's always through a question and a question. And, and actually, it's, to unpack that, you have to sort of, these are really important tools in, in unpacking that. And so we shouldn't we sort of make too light of it because the majority is making light of it. So we don't need to add our voices to their canon. It's the idea of, you know, we can still have meaning, but we can still bring in the pleasure, the sensual. We don't have to go to the logos to have to make something stick. And also nothing's wrong with masturbation. Nothing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but Grace, what are you hearing in all this? Otherwise, nothing's wrong with masturbation. No, seriously, it's just it's just like it's just like not sticking. At the all. only thing that I'm hearing is that he's setting up writing and speech um, within what he's stating and orality, and that when he talks about different from difference, he talks about the I as it's something that you when you say it in speech, he he would he has to actually say to you difference with an A in order for you to pick up the difference anyway, and that's the point of it, that it is the same, but it expresses something that is unsayable. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're saying, is Henry would be very happy now. Um, it needs a, the, the distance, in that he, in his, in fact he has to specify what is written, because it does not appear in the speech, he is what shows that the text is not a simulacrum. Solid is consistent. It shows that the text is a simulacra. No, I think it's not. Isn't it? I'm not sure it matters, does it? I mean, it's not. It's not that. It's no, not no, that no, no. Which, which one is a simulacra? It's not the that, that, that copy that Plato sees in writing. Plato, Plato, in the, in the, the dialogue with uh, Derrida analyzes or uses as a jumping board, says that. Um, spoken words carry the life of life, the life of, of spirit, of the good, and text instead would be a dead version of it. It would be sterile, or you used this expression. You, you look at ghost writing. Yes, how and writers it's, it's, so it's negative, and it's precise because it does not reflect the life that it is still instead carried by the, the, spoken, the spoken word. If we think of, of um, Irigare, the forgetting of hair, there is a similar point Argument, in there. Yeah. <clears throat> but on the other hand, he is also saying that text also does hold these kind of nuances. That yeah, this is what I'm saying. So it has all the nuances that okay, okay. make it not a dead copy. It right. Is, it is live. Right, right, right. It is live in, in a way that is different than the speech. Of right. It. So it is also a simulacra. I don't know what is wrong with that thing and why it keeps doing that. Um, but anyway, so it is also a simulacra. Well, I always understand a simulacra as, as something that is hollow, something that pretends to be what it's not. So a simulacra is more than a copy. But, okay, well, but if a simulacra isn't that, if a simulacra is precisely that, which is what we said to start with, this groundless thing that exists, that there's no first to it, there's no start to it, it creates an environment. Okay, that, I would it creates not call a it a simulacrum because simulacrum carries too much uh, negativity with itself. So tainted from the way it was used by him, and the parallel text of the most part about the Lotus Fallacy. You know, I wouldn't call it. I would call it surface. I would call it something else, but not, not simulacrum. Okay, is that true for you? Would you call surface or simulacrum? Um, I'd look at simulacrum in terms of a language such as English, which uses, which uh, a letter represents a sound. So there's a mapping going on, it's, phono, it's a phonocentric language, but you know, Derrida makes the comparison to hieroglyphs or ideograms, which yeah. are logocentric. They, they, they don't represent sounds, they, they're logocentric. They Pictorial, or they have something else going symbolic, on. Symbolic, yeah. yeah. Right. So, to the degree to that, which that an English text similar. or a text that uses a phonic relationship is itself embedding the orality 
you would say that that creates some form of a simulacrum. Yeah. Okay. Now, yes. Okay. Now, back to you. You're correct. You, your reading is correct. Okay. However, my question to you then would be, what do you think is the difference between difference with an E and difference with an A? Well, I would have that he's, he's there is no difference. There is no difference. <laughs> but the, it implies that there's something that's unsaid on, or that there's something else happening, but he doesn't ever, that you can't articulate that. I think that's what I was thinking you were saying, cause because of metaphysical language, it's impossible to name the difference. Or even, he says he, difference is not a name, it's not an anything. It's just a, a something that adds to either text or speech. That's what mm -hmm. A supplement of some kind that isn't really a supplement and so on yeah. and so forth. Okay. You okay with that? Is that true? Is it? Is that how you see difference? Yeah, I think it's you know, sort of like, um, I think it's like the virtual. It's, 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 like, it's like the virtual. The virtual. And it's mm -hmm. like animation. It's wanting to get at an materiality. Um, and, well, in, in, in the difference one, he said it, he, he sort of to explain it, he sort of um, puts temporization in sort of one aspect, of, and then it's the space in the other aspect. And so the space in she makes the immateriality or um, the virtue of Deleuze, um, which is this um, how a pattern operates as a surface sort of sense of things, that kind of materiality. Whereas um, the temporization is, is the sort of, well, this is, he uses, he uses these chains of words for the two meanings of difference, which is like this deferring, and then there's like the differing. No, no, don't give up on that. You're deferring the deferring, yeah, go on. What happens well, if you defer well, something? Well, the deferring is, is what sort of links in the chain and takes you to the, the temporization, which really to me seems like another word for representation. And um, the, uh, where's the space in, he's really trying to get, get at this, um, like, a, this injection of this, the present of metaphysics, because it's this other kind of materiality. Um, warm and warm, warm. Okay, getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. So, so there's something about this E and this A that are, are different well, comments. What I'm saying is that in this um, misstep, actually this stumbling upon uh, a sound which could be written in two different ways, there is a active or, or a, a, an unmaterialism or a, almost you, you see it as more uh, productive than just a gap as uh, the uncertainty that Google finds in, uh, in mathematics. I always read it as actually in the text we see that the universe is not completely it's not totalized. You, you, see, you seem to say that actually from that gap a more positive energy is um, percent possible. No, it's just, well, it's just, just this, um, this that bit where he sort of, uh, like, well, actually, it's really, the, the translator's notes are very useful. <laughs> you laugh so much. <laughs> so there's that bit where he's, like, uh, explains how he gets to different, how he, why he uses the A, it's just because he felt, like, necessarily, but it could be, um, but he, it's, like, to do with gerunds and things, sort of, he um, takes you through the different sort of parts of the word. He sort of says that the, yeah, the difference with an E um, like has these two senses to it. It means, it means deferring, it also means differing, and then it takes you through those. I mean, and then, um, I don't know which part of the verb it is. Yeah, it, yeah, I think it was if it was making it active. Like, uh, if the different part of it was active in French, it would be with an A that they don't have that. So, so he's put that back into it to bring out that this aspect. Um, oh, active. Um, of gerunding um, is um, yeah. ing. Gerund is yeah, ing. Which, which is about this kind of like sort of, which is this whole question through this that he's sort of um, referring this back to Heidegger. Okay. 
We're almost there. Does that answer your question? Nope. <laughs> there we go. I want to make sure uh, we're bringing Grace on board here. We make sure that Grace. <laughs> Grace is well ahead. She got some misjudgment. She's shit. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, no, don't worry, Grace. Um, now, what are you hearing from what? I'm sorry to put you on the spot here, but we're all friends, including the World Best Lab. Too. No, but what do you hear Dane saying? Um, well, I'll say that I didn't read the phone call, so I apologize. Okay, but, <laughs> but what did you hear him saying just now? Um, I don't know. <laughs> what, what do you think is being said? Well, the, the English language is phonetic, whereas other languages, like you were saying, hieroglyphics, completely relies on the image or the symbols within a language. Okay. Um, but you can still read it, but it's not oral. Okay, so in short, you're not you're not quite yet hearing because uh, let's say let's say we're speaking in Chinese. Obviously, we're not speaking Chinese, which is clearly not a phonetically written language. But to hear it, clearly, it's got all different ways of speaking. I mean, do you think that Derrida is suggesting that if you if you were writing this in Chinese, you have a totally different philosophy going on here? Did you say yes? Yes. No, I'm going to disagree. I'm going to have to put a knife in all of your heads. <laughs> I don't think so. I think that, I mean, I think this is one of the bases that it doesn't matter that, I so okay, so in Japan last week, it became fairly obvious to me when I was trying to find my way around that that Japanese, some Japanese taxi drivers couldn't read a map. Couldn't read what? A map. No, no, no. Well, no, no one could read the map. But, um, <laughs> but there, there are two ways. There are two ways of, of writing the Japanese language. There's, I think, uh, I'm not sure. Is, is it kanji, which is the yeah. kanji, the pictorograms, and then there's, for the sake of a better word, the phonetic way of writing it. And in other words, the way that we could we could have a chance of reading it. And it seemed quite obvious that. That they couldn't read the the phonetic way. Right. Makes sense. So, huh. well, no, not well. I, I mean, that's just what it was. But um, so, if if you kind of if you differentiate between a, a sort of phonetic way and a, if you differentiate between a pictogram and a phonetic way of writing things, then that doesn't really make sense. You know what I've said. If you if you regard there being two orders of representation. So I think uh, I'm going to have to disagree because I think that even though it appears what we call phonetic, that we're really just looking at pictures and that there's no way of looking at an N or an O or whatever that you could possibly guess what that sound was if you hadn't already been taught what that sound was. In precisely the same way as the Japanese taxi driver, he, he can make perfect sense of the pictogram because he's been taught, hasn't been taught, or hasn't bothered being taught the... Uh, hasn't taught himself the the anglicised letters, so therefore has no idea what, what the thing says. Um, so they're all they're all. But I mean, they're, all, they're all similar of, of the kind of yes, spoken language. Yes, this is the key and, here. And so no, because you don't speak Japanese, you don't you can't take as much as spoken language because that, even the spoken language does not make any sense to you. It does in its orality. You can tell it's someone's it's orality, a orality. If someone's angry with you, you can tell whatever language they're speaking. That doesn't mean so you need to understand the language. Yeah, but that's not down to the words. So you, you can, you can I mean, get that from different, you know, I don't think it is, is uh, much useful having a specific material examples, but you can channel to your dog with the most sweet words, or vice versa, speak in the sweetest way with the most harsh words, and the dog responds to the tone. It's not the meaning mm -hmm. of the language. So that, so that the letter, the, rather, the words are a simulacrum of an emotive or communicative No, I don't, I don't think, I, I think that it's actually a, try it. a complete internal economy that, uh, of, of exchange. This is why I said that I don't find, at least I cannot see any in the singularities that are just a matter of relating one thing to the next. Next, okay, well, let, let, let me just try and rejig the agenda for here. One is that the Parmacon has something to do with the staging of a simulacra. That's the first point. And this Pharmacon that stages a simulacra 
as having at least a multiple of something going into it that can produce paradoxical reactions, death, health, whatever, which may or may not be opposites, but they can be antinomies in the Kantian sense. They can be contradictory, they can be antagonists, but the point is, is that they're multiple. The point is that they're not the same thing, that it's not a homogeneous... And they're, en they're entries into the protocol. Their entry. Now the pharmacon is is. Multiplicity is an entry. Is entering the pharmacon? Or no, is the pharmacon. Is it? The pharmacon is always already plural. And so it's trying to get one to understand how plurality. That that which makes up something greater than one, greater than homogeneous. That's what we mean by one here. So. Homogeneous means one. Heterogeneic means more than one. So that the heterogeneic thing, the pharmacon, is able to create this cohesive thing called pharmacon because um, it can do depending on how the pharmacon is then put into action, i.e. context, used, something, the economy that it gets involved with, ends up being able to either produce good, bad, something. So that's where the relativity comes in. On the other hand, the pharmacon itself is this entity that is itself made up of a plurality. So, so, so think about that if you have a cohesive environment, and the cohesive environment is not homogeneic, but heterogeneic, something has created the heterogeneity. Something has created the, the energy fields, the intensities that create this thing called, in this case, the pharmacon. And that pharmacon doesn't necessarily have a beginning that, you know, you took some chocolate and you took some milk and you created chocolate milk. It doesn't have it, it doesn't begin like that. Yes? Yes. No, go on. Um, well, I was just thinking about how the meaning's always at least doubled, so. I, I put it down as, as a sort of a dualism rather than a, well, no, duality rather than a dualism. Yeah, duality, yes. Yeah. So, you know, like waves, Wavelengths and particles can be the same thing, but they're not the same thing. Like virtual particles, that they act exactly like particles, but they're not really particles. But you can call them particles because they act exactly like a particle. Yes. So superposition. Yeah. Yes. Good. It's it's yeah again because of relativity. There's no using, there's no absolute spatial temporal framework. Newtonian physics has gone out the window. It's it's all relative, but then I'm still stuck with this. How can you deal with relativity for So well, let's not go there yet. <laughs> let's just say that the pharmacon is both, let's say, created as such, is assembled as such. It, it doesn't, it might start off in life as a pharmacon, but somehow it got assembled. And, and that assembly is called pharmacon in this example A. And then the pharmacon also, depending on how it is brought into the economy of meanings, so either in an economy or it's in a medical moment, it's, you know, you're going to poison, you're going to homeopathic, whatever the various things, that also is the way in which it can be, quote, read. So the very first thing to get a hold of with uh, the pharmacon is the pharmacon itself implies or means both surface that is itself heterogeneic and economy that is itself mobile, moving, relative. It has it has it's not st static. So there's this energy field and there's this doubling. This multiplicity. That's the very first thing that you have to get a sense of with the pharmacon. And in understanding that and get grasping that type of movement, that's when you begin to tease out where this difference 
where something can have, if it's heterogeneic, it means that there's different entities in there. Particle, wave, whatever, I mean, proton, neutron, neutron, or whatever the thing is. So, or, or, or ghost, reality, the, the, and not in the sense that they're opposites, but in the sense that they're not the same thing. Chew, coffee cup. Would it help to read this from the different ones, the second page? Okay. Paragraph one, two, three. Okay. Uh, I'll play down to the paragraph, or to the two paragraphs. He writes, the A of difference task is not earth. It remains silent, secret and discreet as a tongue. Wait. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the, the paragraph starts with the four uh, preliminary. Uh, let me recall that this is discreet. Oh, yeah, okay, right, okay, got it. Okay, so page three in this book. Okay, yeah. The A of difference does is not heard. It remains silent, discreet, secret, and discreet. Wait, 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 wait. That's the paragraph, but then where is it? the A? Hegel's Encyclopedia, Egyptian Pyramid, just after that. Okay, so this one, it is offered by a mute mark. I would say even a... It is offered by a mute mark, yes. And by a tacit, <laughs> tacit monument. I would even say by a pyramid. Uh, thinking not only of the form of the letter when okay. it is printed uh, as a capital, but also of the text of the encyclopedia, the body, blah, 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 blah. The A of difference does is not heard. It remains silent, secret, and discreet as a tone. Or it is. It's and thereby, let us anticipate the delineation of a site and the familiar residence and tomb of the proper in which is produced by difference the economy of death. This stone, provided one knows how to secret its description, is not, from, is not far from announcing the death of the tyrant. Translation. Now, I think um, there are, there are two, two um, points that caught my attention here. One is uh, that he associates some with poikesis, which, of course, is a house, I think. It is also the root of economy, which means more or less that the economy is a distribution, a way of managing things. And then the fact that he associated with this with death and the economy of death, which, which is the destructive. I, mean, I have the, the idea of, of uh, the death drive, Freudian death drive. Um, so, Ochesis, you said it means house. Well, it is. It, Oikos means house. Ochesis would be like dwelling. Or dwelling. I, I right. guess I'm just trying to, to, to make sense of the word. I don't know it directly. But, uh, and I know it is the root of economy. Mm -hmm. um, he actually starts the text. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and thereby let us anticipate the delineation of a site is creating a distribution. You, you started off today when speaking about mm -hmm. patterns. Yeah. Patterns that are not symmetrical, but are rhythms. Yeah. You know, points. Um, the familiar residence, so house you match, and tomb of the proper yeah. in which is produced. Um, and it's produced by the difference, by this uh, um, double heterogeneic world which is the economy of death. So why? And why is that the economy of death? Because why is that the I economy mean, of, I don't know, consumer shopping? Because there is something that is uh, an irretrievably wasted or lost. It's the disappearance of the trace of the trace. The disappearance oh, of the trace. It's, 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 <laughs> it's the proper, it's that, that which belongs. So it's the kind of intact, it's the it's a virgin. The, the, yeah. The struct, but it's the it's the structure that is prop that it, it's the structure that is itself a structure. It's somehow now it's casting out, you know. So I don't know. I always call it like the kind of the, the virgin, you know, the virgin, which is so everything it's is the absolute the, pure. Yeah, the, the sealed the sealed borders, um, and the the essence inside, and we're starting to. And why would uh, that be the economy of death? Because. The, once it's once you you can't become a virgin. Once you're not once the once the 
Yes. Quentin <laughs> 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 um, you once the seal is broken and um, the the essence is is rejected and, and pushed out there, then you know this is what I was trying to say. This is the kind of this is the the putrid inconvenient. The, yes, it would be fantastic to be kind of to walk around in this uh, state of complete hermeticism, all sealed, not requiring anything else not understanding that there was anything else out there, just being content in, in, uh, in a uh, chrysalis or something like this. Um, but the inconvenient truth is that there is an out there and there is an other and there is a difference and the death is the death of the, the death innocence. of the proper. The, well, innocence, yes, yes, in it's contamination. Sense. I mean, but the, the proper is, is also, is uh, also is the, the authority of the father of, of Plato's pharmacy. Father. Sorry, what is the innocence is also and the purity the proper here is the authority of the father of Logos in the in That's because of the relation to things. Because you're speaking out of things. Yeah, exactly. So this, the purity of this is why it just it earlier he speaks of Hegel, he mentions Hegel. We write that passage of Hegel at the beginning of the seminar in, in October. Yeah. In which the, passage? The, in the phenomenology spirit where Hegel speaks of how he describes how he links a word to its object, and why that word means that object and we can trust it. And here is that is in the if in Plato's pharmacy the Rebbe says that we would, have, we would need the presence of the Father to guarantee that the written text is meaning what the spoken word means, which we know because it is life means the real copica. Here, and this is the proper the, pro, the problem of the proper name. That it, uh, the fact that the name really means the thing it's mean, it means. And instead here, because there is something else that drives away from it, disconcerts it, that's what the best and the economy of that is. It just subtract from a sign and its meaning and just cuts the gap, the gap opening to this relationship. It's not, at, it's not pointing to another, mm -hmm. it's just leaving it open. Okay, yeah, I mean, this I, is I, a way of, it, and that's why it dies. That's why it's an economy of death. Yes. It turns. It turns this. It turns it's this. Uh, it's just one thing. It also turns that. As, um, as it it, it often happen. turns a chrysalis into a tomb. Yeah. Because there's no open. And yet the minute it, well, it is once open, it, once it is open, that's it. it is yeah. open, then it's no longer. It's it's no longer the site of the of the, the proper, and it becomes the tomb. You know, an open tomb. But the, I guess my question is, I think you're right. I mean, I think. I just want to say that is what's going on here and that does answer that question but the, I guess my sub question my irritating question is why or where does the improper go where does the site of that which is neither proper nor dead go well, it's like with the writing for that, I believe. okay yeah, that, that, yeah. Uh, can I read a yeah sure sure yeah, it, um, because we're talking about this logos, I think it's, 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 it's going to say it's going to be a, it's a living language. So I'm going, it's, where, it's, where are you? I'm on the, the um, Plato's pharmacy. It's um, the father of the logos. Um, no one's got that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no, <laughs> That's right. So, no, we have it. So, it's, um, it's like uh, the father of the logos is two, isn't it? And then it's two, three, four pages beyond that. Um, so I just read it. Yeah, just read yeah. it, yeah. Slowly. So, um, I have to start somewhere. Oh, so it says, Logos is a zoo. I'll take this to me. Zoo, an animal, yeah. Animal. An animal that is born, grows, belong to fusis, um, physics. Nature. Yeah, yeah. Um, ling linguistics, logic, dialectics, and zoology are all in the same camp, so it's living language. Yeah. In describing Logos as a zoo, Plato is following a certain rhetors and sophists before him, who, as a contrast to the cadaverous rigidity of writing, had held up the living spoken word, which infallibly conforms to the necessities of the situation at hand, to the expectation and demands of the interlocutors present which sniffs out the spots where it ought to produce itself, feigning to bend and adapt at the moment it is actually achieving maximum persuasion and control. Logos, a living animate creature, is thus also an organism that has been engendered. 
an organism, a differentiated body proper with a center and extremities, joints, a head and feet. In order to be proper, a written discourse ought to submit to the laws of life just as a living discourse does. Logographical necessity ought to be analogous to biological or rather zoological necessity, otherwise it obviously it would neither have head or nor tail. Both structure and constitution are in question in the risk run by the logos of losing sorry. Both structure and constitution are in question in the risk run by logos of losing through writing both its tail and end. So he's saying you know, he's saying that lo lo the logos is living language. Um, uh, is, is, is endangered by, by, by the written in this, with this here, but then there's that thing he does. It, it, they say that you know, Derrida writes and can write in a way that you cannot speak it. He writes, you know, and then when he starts playing with Melamy and, and, and that kind of thing. And, and just this idea of um, uh, the jointure is, is to do with system. So he's talking about the, the way writing can, you know, the way that we talk about puty fracture, mm -hmm. seems to me he's inverted the idea of this living language. You know, the, you know, Putrefaction is a living, living organism. So language putrefies as part of that living, the living flesh, as it were. Yeah, the decay. Yeah, yeah, and then it's out of that. You know, it's out of the decay, but its writing sort of sits in that tepid. You know, something. That, I think that's something like that figure. Of absolutely. No, no, general. absolutely. But the question becomes, and this is yeah. my own. Um, sorry, I just raise it. This question of the engendering of language. That, of language by engendering does strike me as saying. Not in gen, not by by the word engendering. It seems to call forward that it has a meaning that is located sexually in the in the genitals. So 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 that you have the male female engendering is what he brings in, which I think is his you know sort of downfall in that sense. Yeah. But there's another, isn't there another meaning of engendering? And that's which and, is which is gender neutral, which is just making meaning, engendering well, yes, meaning. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. yes. Giving birth to all but that, that's what I want to be clear here. I want to yeah. make sure, and to me, when he starts talking about the proper engendering is when he starts doing this male, female, the Cora, the, you know, the father, the son, you know, and all the rest of the things that, you know, either speak to, uh, you know, sort of the patriarchy, the misogyny or whatever. And then when he talks about the improper, which he really doesn't talk about, actually, Sixu is more into that. Than, um, than Derrida, but there, the, it seems to me the improper would be the, the generating of the sensuous without a lot, without uh, uh, sort of closing off or making into the tomb, the economy of death, uh, the, um, the, 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 the tail back into, you know, male versus female, or, you know, lack versus phallus, or whatever they use. Also mythological. The like improper. The improper, the, yeah. the, myth, the yeah. mythological. Yeah. yeah, and that's, yeah. but see, the thing is, then the question becomes, how does the mythological become real? And this was Nietzsche's question. Nietzsche raises it in, um, gosh, um, I'll have to get the proper footnote to that. I can't think of it now. Uh, where he says, you know, um, that he's fighting for a time when uh, the real world becomes a myth, and when the myth becomes the real world. Um, but I will get to that. I can't think where that's from. I think it's from Human All to Human, but I'm not 100% certain on that one. Um, anyway. I was going to say, can I, can I just say how, how, I mean, I find this absolutely fascinating, where, where you know, he, like having said that, there's this sort of limit, and there's, and the limit is this kind of body, and embodied, embodied both the text and the voice, but here the text, that he then, rather than kind of, rather than see, he sort of works with the kind of, he works with the limit rather than against it, and doesn't, instead of trying to transgress it, pushes away from it, and we go into the text of the texter's body, and mm -hmm. he starts to, Complicated further and says, you know, that there are, there are new there are new rules and biological rules, you know, that we so instead of kind mm -hmm. of trying to transgress rules, he sets new rules. In this case, biological rules. So he insists it's the insistence of metaphor to start creating something that's really literally vital, mm -hmm. you know, and, and interesting for that, um, and it, that includes things like cellular decay and putrefaction and um, 
Bubble bones and, whatever, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, enzymes and things like this. But uh, in the textual way, I find that absolutely fascinating. No, it's very, that, that, that is crucial. But to me, I say this respectfully, the error I think that Derrida makes is that he insists on it being the proper. When in fact he actually is not having to go into transgression, which is correct, but it's actually the so-called improper. Again, what Nietzsche would have as the gay science or what, you know, um, I think Deleuze is trying to develop as plan of imminence, though I'm not sure even with that. So it, it seems to me that in attempting to, um, to show how those limits take on this putrefication, this, this different degrees of decay, different tones of decay, it seems to me that he's, he's, he's goes back to an old form of plastic rather than a new, you know, so it goes back to the Cora, and the Cora becomes the female, and the, you know, and the, uh, and the phallus becomes the male, and so, and, and it's just like, why? Why would you do this? You know, why not start really disrupting? No, the question is, is, is he, is, does he do that? Because, that is the question, yeah. Because he, well, does he do that because he's contaminating his own, his own sample um, with, like, his own interiority with, uh, with ex with external and external political contaminants, or is something else going? But, um, yeah, but the, the, and, and pardon me, but just while I finish this last uh, parlay, uh, it's also the question of then the type of sexualities that he's putting forward, because in his notion of then perversions, um, like in the postcard and so on, the perversions are very much rooted in a heterosexual. Not even heterosexual, I mean, because it's not even male-female. It's, it's the worst versions of understanding female as passive and, and male as aggressive. And what becomes perverse is the male wants to be the female, or whatever, the, you know, how he starts playing this around. And it's just like, you know, honestly, there's no room, despite the fact he's made a lot of room, there's no, it seems to be no room for um, ways of talking about the polymorphous perversity sexuality. He can't talk about it. He has to keep going back to these uh, limits set up by the proper. And I, I think that his own work should lead him to the improper, but in fact he keeps leading back to the proper. Mm. That's yeah, I'm not sure you're using the proper in the same way as he's using it though. No, I mean proper in the in the in the in the static, in the yeah. named yes, okay. sense. Okay. That's what I mean. Yeah. I'm not gonna say where he's writing about the anatomy of the year to really almost to see well where does really meaning take place take place? Where does the passage from the outside to the interior of the for the phonetic language becomes meaning takes place? And it goes into a very detailed description of the year. Mm -hmm. And it just occurred to me now speaking of the proper that although there, there have been a lot of filters in between, he's still dealing with the the question of uh, mecha mechani mechanicistic continuity that the card put forward. Everything was connected with something else in a, in a chain of cause effect, and there was no void. So nothing could be improper because nothing could just go off its mark. And he, he, although he's questioning the proper, and he is finding that it's not a notable a grid with vertical and horizontal line, all he finds the continuous line that go from Sign to meaning, not to all the. the was Ariadne's thread? Yes, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, it, 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 the, it the, maintains these. So you think? I mean, I I think that he does create uh, these, let's say, non-linear, non-continuous, um, you know, traces, paths. But the the difficulty is, is that um, that there is no way to to freight or to put forward this thing called the improper, and by which I don't mean, you know, um, I don't know, like being a rebel or something, I don't mean improper that, I mean that which will never be fully formed, that which will never be anything other than, let's say, you know, the nickname, not or the, you know, the, the half noun, you know, the, the, the almost gerund, <laughs> you know, like the, this kind of thing. And that's why there's a whole series of writing on Derrida with Derrida on the word perhaps and with and you know, saying, okay, no, he does deal with the improper, he does deal with the not quite, 
in these kind of ways. So I, I just want to throw that out just to say that on the one hand, what he's doing here is showing how proper gets established as such, and how the proper in getting established always already creates this kind of tune and, and this kind of jazz. So the difference versus the difference, the differing, the distance, the, 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 the ways in which spaces can be brought in to an otherwise uh, homogeneic simulacra is crucial here. That's what he's getting at. But then I'm not, and I don't want to um, polarize it because I, 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 I'm actually really one, pardon me, wondering how this gets developed in his work in a way that doesn't land us right back to these usual splits between male and female, because I just don't understand why one has to go there. It just seems crazy to go through this entire detailed, incredibly uh, delicate way of analyzing, and then boom, we get back to, like, again, the, the usual suspects. And I find that, I find that just... Some is a very strong um, um, gravity pull towards the rule of Heidegger, which looks back and instead of um, uh, um, forward, forward or towards the future. So the temporality problem in the regard is that of an always already trace. Now, the, the, the unity is always already lost, and we find these gaps like different and also. And, it's, and then what we have is what we have. Well, that's a very interesting criticism. While, um, at least in the verse, which I, I love so much, and now I'm finding more and more problematic, <laughs> the, 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 the issue is the, the, oh, pres the frontier of the, Lauren defends. the frontier of the present <laughs> in, in, in the looking forward. I'll do things, uh, I'm reading uh, um, Without Criteria of Shabiro. How yeah. the, how does something new happen? And he... Okay, this is the basis of part of Marx's thesis, the question of the new. But anyway, go on. I, look, I'm not that familiar with the old work of Derrida, but from, from the... A few things I have read, and these are being read today again this week. It seems to me that he's not direct. Or he's not looking at, at this as a very important point as the generation of new. He's looking at how this has taken place. And if he is looking at how this has taken place, then from those purposes that you are giving make sense because it is taking the distribution as it has been traditional. Well, but of course that isn't how it has been a tradition. No, but no, the tradition, the official... Uh, the, but the, that's the, what I'm saying, it was like it just wipes tyrant, out. The very tyrant is announcing the death of, which instead uh, is, is not fully killing. And not only not fully killing, but resurrecting in a yes. multitude of, it's like couch grass. But he's in, in his thing where he's like sort of setting up this difference, and within this difference, which is both deferring and and stuff which all relates to the, I think, the temporization which relates to the representation. He said, that's not, that's not got rid of the, 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 the sort of, that's just sort of still there as proper. So it's not sort of being rejected in a more radical way. It's almost as if it's a necessity or something still. Possibly. I mean, that, that I think we need to develop more before we like, throw that out completely. Um, now, back to Grace. Now, don't think that you're being picked on, because you're not. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. In what way has this, has, this, has this new conversation done anything to do other than the either knife in the head approach or the, you know, the whoosh? <laughs> knife in the head. Oh, excellent. We've gone from going over the head to knife in the head. Okay. Um, just not, it just. Maybe I'm, I'm just like reducing it too much, but it seems, it seems like he's saying something that's self evident. Quite simplistic. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not simplistic. I can understand why he's complicated. I mean. But so, what, what are you hearing that he's saying that's simplistic? Or what is he basically saying? Just that he's, that he's trying to set up that language. Oh, I would be able to say it now in a simplistic way. It seems simplistic when I read it. <laughs> but um, I think, actually, do you know what? I can't. OK, <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Don't worry. Okay. Um, can someone, uh, Mark, can you explain what Grace's problem is? 
that's the first, that's the first, it's all, it's, because we're talking about difference, and it is the normal version of difference before we get to, uh, <laughs> the before we get to the Derridian things. But first of all, first and of all. what's the normal sense of difference? Separation. Okay. Like something that is, something that is not what it was, you know, so there's a kind of separation. Um, so the first thing is, is that, is that language, it's not like language and, and meaning is all, is all, is any longer one thing, you know, completely. If you read, you understand. No, it doesn't happen. <laughs> so meaning, we'll be happy to know. meaning, yeah, <laughs> meaning is, meaning is cast out, right? So, so this is where the tomb comes in because this becomes a, a little bit of an empty, you know, a broken thing, an empty shell. So the, the, the assumption, because he's breaking apart assumptions here, that oh, you get your meaning in, in the, either the text or in what somebody's saying to you in, in spoken language, that, that's broken out and the two things become kind of tombs. But they're also, they're also bodies, the bodies of a tomb. So in this, kind of meaning's cast out and it's like sort of this, this sort of big different, undifferentiated pool. And then he, he breaks apart language and, and the speaking Sorry, the sorry, text and spoken language, and in this in this breaking apart, the language that is spoken takes time, and so there's this deferred there's this deferred aspect, which also references the notion of death, you know, the the, the time thing, because he loves a bit of death. They all love a bit they of death. Love death. But, but why that? does How it reference? That? That's good so far. So why does it reference death? Because it's because it's not just it's not just a pure sort of modelled difference in the way that Heidegger kind of pulled apart well, a, a equals A. Yeah. It's, it's... It's a feedback loop. Yeah, there, there, there's, there's this kind of... Con this, I, don't want to, I don't want to start over... <laughs> the over over this, egging o the over, Well, over <laughs> explaining my simplified version, but... Um, <laughs> there's this sort of notion of um, living language, dying speech, um, and it's this kind of the sort of I think the, the the flora and fauna of the body, the sort of you know the kind of cultures of that the surround putrefaction and death and maggots and stuff. I think if you kind of keep that in mind, that sort of thing. Well, there's you know there's maggots of yeah. rotting flesh. I think that's quite a good because two two different kind of uh, processes. I mean, like, like wait, 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 I'm sorry. You can speak, but I think that, but, just get through the maggots. But the, 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 <laughs> the new thing, what he really brings new. Is the to changing from difference to difference, or you know however you want to spell it, um, is that is this notion of the deferred or the delayed, and there's time, there's a time thing in there, and quite quite why he does that, I'm not too sure. I mean, apart from the fact that language takes time, but if you start a sentence, the first word is already dead by the time you finish it, you know. So, uh, but why is it dead? Why does he? Because it's already it's kind of already happened. So I, I suppose to, to go with what Matthias is saying, if there was if there is a privilege, privileging of the of the text, he's saying that the text can kind of exist in this sort of body state. But language is language is sort of static and dying and deferred. Um, but then let's push it even further. This is a good question. Why is it dead? Because just because it's in the past doesn't mean it's 100% dead, which is why he has ontology as the trace. Because he says that the trace is the past that's never been present. Yes. So. Good. See? Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing it down. <laughs> now what are you going to say? Oh, no. Well, I'm sorry. Well, 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 it's just It's just... It's just, it's just it's, I mean, because in the putrefaction thing, it comes into the pharmacon, because I haven't read that bit. Which bit have you read the poem? I haven't read that bit. I've read it. Okay. okay. Yes. But I suppose I, uh, it's, a, it's got questions of order and disorder. Well, putrefaction might appear in disorder, but it's still sort of a messiness. It's still an ordering sort of pattern. It's there, but but then pattern doesn't mean identity. But again, but um, so you're like, saying that the putrefaction is still a pattern. And yeah, but that doesn't imply identity. But I'm not quite sure how he's using that putrefaction thing. I don't know that bit. But it was in well, it was in Tehran. But um, 
but how, why would something be called putrid? I mean, obviously, if they called it nice and wonderful and sweet smelling, then nobody would read it. But uh. putrid is a, is a is a state of rotting where the rotting turns into it's a bifurcation between like a, a straightforward decay, but it's turning into something else. Some kind of alcohol or something. Perhaps not alcohol, but sorry. Yeah, so yeah, I'll disagree. Yeah. yeah, is it? I don't know what it, what it's turning into. I don't think it's literally alcohol, but it must be one of the alcohols. Fermenting of some kind. It's a kind of sort of fermenting, and uh, so you know, you haven't got something basically as simple as sort of turning to dust. You've got something that's actually yeah. kind of a process that's that's going on. And in fact, I think it's the fact it's still alive. Right. Yeah, 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 and there's and there's a, and I presume I'm. I'm I'm no chemist, but presumably there's kind of uh, there's a growth in the fact that you have some kind of equation building up, some sort of biological equation building up, and you're gaining. I, don't know, I mean, maggots, maggots. I don't know. I think they past they used to think that maggots grew out of it, but presumably not. Um, so presumably there's yeah. kind of fertility, <laughs> there's fertility there. Yeah, there's a fertility where, there's a where fertility maggots come to feed yeah. and uh, so on and so forth. So it's kind of, um, albeit rather distasteful, but it's a kind of growth growth of life process out of dying or out of death, fruit, flesh. Anything. So is it possible when he talks about the tomb of death? I presume it means getting an emergence sort of probably in that process. But emergence yeah. is coming from decay. Yeah. I mean I think we're putting words into his mouth because he only used it as an adjective very briefly. Mm -hmm. So I think it was me who said like the, the body because the well, he does use it in his impound. Does, does he does use yeah, it again? Because yeah. I, I think it's a kind of... In fact, of, he calls it a, a putrid semi-micro. Right, okay, yeah. okay. But um, I mean, he's using it in the column that he's being more, let's say, fleshy yeah. about, rather than more logical. I think he'd like, he'd, he'd, he'd like to kind of, he'd like us to see the, the text as this this body, like a, 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 like a, a, a flesh body with li the li same limits as the flesh has. But then to say that this flesh can, you know, is subject to biological laws, you know, so can go either way, can die out of the death, can come kind of conditions for sort of seething kind of life, whatever it might be, you know. I mean, could be diseased, could be, so, you know, so does that hormone. Again. So, so in your view, though, He's saying something that's fairly straightforward. Out of life comes death, out of death comes life. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that he's saying more than that then. Otherwise, it's kind of like annoying that we spend this much time on, on old Derrida. Um, so it seems that, so what's on the table, as it were, is this question around what is a simulacrum, which I'm not yet convinced that people get what this is, and how that is either different or similar or doing something else altogether from a surface. And how simulacra as a surface creates a limit or may create a limit or in somehow limits are not only invested on and with and by simulacra, but are also simulacra can be a limit, can be used as a limit. And then the question becomes of how this question of deferring, i.e. letting something pass versus uh, being uh, the differing as a separating. So this question of the temporality of the movement, of duration, of simultaneity, all coming in to this question of the difference. And then we circle back to this question of the aural, A-U-R-A-L, as the way in which some kind of a trace uh, I was going to say trajectory, but I think trace is better. Obviously, it's better. It's trajectory and move. Um, is itself uh, imbued or um, shaped by pharmacon, the pharmacon. So the pharmacon keeps coming around as a a way in to to seeing how something is established as the is. So yes, but the. What the what said before and the specifying of the trace is a past that never happened that allows to, to give a condensed but I hope clear picture of what we say. 
the simulacrum is not is not only the text or the speech. Something the simulacrum is the whole set of our cultural distribution, our present. Because if we are thinking of the past that did not take place, it means going back along the ideal timeline. At a certain point, we find a gap. So the thing does not stand up properly. Or if you think of it as a structure, there are missing bits. I'm looking at the wall in front of it. If there were some missing bits here and there, you could shift things around. It wouldn't keep, it wouldn't keep an order. So it's, it's alleged order, the fact that it makes sense that when I use a word, it means that object or that meaning, or when I say I mean this, I really mean that, is to use a lighter word, an appearance a representation of, of uh, something that is not as solid as we think it is. This is the way the way it uses simulacrum here, yeah, I think. Do you think that, I'm not 100% certain about that, but would you say, given your argument, that simulacra could therefore mean the same word as atmosphere? Atmosphere as in um, a feeling of a place or, or um, no? Okay. Um, um, I would actually, this is why I was saying that simulacra are tainted with negativity radically and they use the Vita um, and then the and the way they circulate in the postmodern decade. Who's they? Um, the simulacra. Oh, I see, <laughs> right, okay. Uh, and, okay. Uh, they, they, are, they are seen as um, negative because they are presenting those things that are hollow. and they, while in the text there are, there are hints that mm, show simulation we actually write as what we call surfaces, things that don't need roots to hold together, is not entirely there, mm -hmm. in my understanding of it at least. And I think it, we, therefore that the word simulacrum, the term itself, is problematic. One should drop that and use surface or something, or atmosphere, or the feeling of the mode today. Or so simulacra, from your argument, can't mean atmosphere because because you're saying that simulacra. It, it is too too tied to simulation. Um, Even the way it's being developed by Derrida here. Yes, I mean my understanding is that Derrida criticizes the reading of language uh, of writing as a simulacra. And yeah, yeah. Language writing is actually self-standard. I don't know if it's, it's but not no, quite no, no, but it's yeah. criticizing the, 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 the reduction of writing to a simulacro. Hmm. It, it, it thinks that there is some life in writing that simulacro would not have because it's that, to the point of being inclusive. So I have a question to ask you because it's five minutes to four. Um, time flies when you're in the Derrida question of difference. Uh, next week, Technically, we're supposed to be on break. Are people on break? Um, what, you're always here. <laughs> Excellent. Because uh, one thing we could do is, uh, well, technically, I mean, I think I am going to be here, but I don't, I think that's important to have this conversation again. I think it's important to go over difference again. I'm sorry about this, because, but I just think that, I know that's very difficult. But I think that it's not, it's just the first time we've bridged it. And I just think we're getting so close to figuring out how to deal with the leotard version of De France, the, you know, uh, Deridian, the Husserli, well, the Husserli, sorry, the uh, Heideggerian moment, and so on, that it might be worth taking one more stab at this. The question I have is do you want to take the stab next week or in three weeks? Because there's two weeks. Um, we, we, technically, we're supposed to come back the second week of August. I mean, the second week of, <laughs> of April. I can be here next week. If, uh, yeah, so I can. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a
Well, um, what's your story? Are you, um, you're here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I am, um, I'm not sure what to do. Um, let me just see if I'm here. Because, uh, I mean, I, I'm here, but whether or not I'm actually yourself and let me know. I would honestly need to decide today because I am waiting for people coming in and I have to tell them if they're coming from perhaps Tuesday or Wednesday. Oh I see, right. Um, so what do you want to do people? Well I, I you can't I need to know whether there's a right. range of meeting then see how much pressure they've got on me. Unfortunately because I said I could do it on that date. Right. Right, okay, then I have another question, which is um, if we don't have the meeting on Tuesday, will you forget about this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Can we not do it so that we reread this, but we also read the section that's been later? Because yes. I think that's, um, I, Leotard went straight over my head, so if I know now that I'm reading it in relation to something okay. else, and that I've got three weeks to do it. <laughs> oh, I see, okay. Yep, we can do that. I get more yeah. out of it. Yeah. Which, which precise section is in the meantime? Um, which one are you thinking of the, in terms of the libidinal economy? Yeah. Or the different Where he talks about the different Yeah. That, we haven't looked at that actually. So that would be in Heidegger and the Jews. And it's uh, the first chapter, different So first chapter of Heidegger and the Jews in the Leotard. The different And. The book is just for. And then there's a book that's different. That's true. Is that uh, translated? In English? Then yes. Okay. So, in fact, that's probably the best thing to look at. Um, if you can't get a hold of the book, then look at the first chapter in Heidegger and the Jews. Um, and then, uh, do, you have, do you have the book? Uh, you always don't have it with you. I don't have the table of contents, but I can tell you which one the table of contents. So what, basically what we're saying is no meeting next week. I will be around uh, so I can have individual tutorials when anybody needs it. And we will reassemble on the 16th. The 9th or the 16th? 16th. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because it's two weeks. Yes? Yes. Uh, now, just before you run away, let me just see if I can get the table of contents. Yeah. yeah, okay, so we've got it here. And um, it's, yeah, phrases in dispute. Um, Around, yeah. Uh, if you can read. This is the book for the firm. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Not as. I would read as much as you could, but up until at least presentation. So it's 1 to 59. Page 1 to 59. Um, and then, but in, but in Heidegger and the Jews, which I think was probably going to be on R. Um, um, uh, yeah, you can read uh, page, uh, actually, the forward by David Carroll is very good. Uh, but uh, the chapter called The Jews in, in small case, little in quotes, one to page 48. You can also read the second one, which is on Heidegger uh, by, by uh, Leotard. But it, it's a scathing attack on uh, Heidegger, which is, I'm not saying it's displaced or not worthy, but um, 
the notion of the differon gets established in the first section. So I thought that was very interesting. Did you guys survive it okay? <laughs> okay, and then you will present uh, the, the the what you didn't present today, and you will represent. Okay. And Barnaby, why don't you do the differon? Which one? The higher than the Jews section. Or just the, the section where the leotard was the, the, clear. Okay, sure. Yeah? Or do you want, Grace, why don't you do that, the leotard one? And Barnaby, why don't you uh, also, along with Lauren, do Difference, the section of Derrida and Difference. Derrida and Difference. And literally margins. margins. Okay. So I think that that will so make it. We are redoing what we did today, then we read. The beginning, one, one part of the different of your part and one part of higher than the Jews. Yeah. That's it. Do, you, do you, either of you want to present on the different? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I want to read them. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're saying, are you going to take your driving test again? Uh, sometimes the teacher, uh, but I'm um, more <laughs> inclined to be triggered around the limousines. They judge your intentions with the form of the natural. Here we go. How can you I mean? You might have run him over. Okay, I'll punch you as well. I won't. You're meant to be at the road rage after you've passed. <laughs> I was standing there, the guy passed by, you might have run him over. Oh, I'm standing here. <laughs> Is it just me who feels a sense of slight reassuredness that uh, <laughs> the <laughs> hasn't <laughs> passed? <laughs> that is too funny. Uh, 30 uh, years on the road with a bicycle, never had a problem, and now it's... So you've, you've, failed, you've, you've only failed once. Twice. you failed twice then. For the same reason, <laughs> process and intentions. I'm not accusing you of meaning maybe later on to do something wrong. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I would recommend uh, getting one of these sort of all-terrain vehicle bikes and just running around in the field for a while so you get the hang of driving. No, I don't have a problem. I mean, I have a driving license. <laughs> I have a driving license. You have a driving license? license? I just have to get the British one because mine is American and it's a I cannot renew it. Uh, you, you actually could renew it. <laughs> Why don't you just renew the American one? I can't. I've got to go to the United States. Uh, and I didn't realize they expired in the United States. They do expire. Do they? But I mean, yeah, I suppose it's a little bit of an effort to go to the United States just to lease it. No, I, don't, I mean, I would have to go to the United States and have a gain on the press and have a gain on the bank account and all these things. I don't oh, exist God, anymore. Yeah, yeah. Mind you, the American driving license, you should be bloody retested. <laughs> so <laughs> fucking cretinously easy. <laughs> I mean, they let 16 year olds. Oh, it's just outrageous. <laughs> 16, 16th birthday. I, I mean, I was driving since I was. Not 16, a lot, lot earlier, a lot younger. Yeah. You can just drive when you're in the face. Yeah, yeah, as long as you can see over there, even if you can't. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like... I mean, it's kind of something of advanced intelligence in America if you can operate a manual car. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very few people can. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't be anti um, um, <laughs> Constantly operating people. Okay, so see you guys uh, uh, in three weeks. Have a lovely uh, vacation. I'll be here next week anyway. Uh, yeah, so if you want to come, you're more than welcome to. But, uh,